This is a story that happened in Hawaii to my brother and his friend. We moved from Japan when I was barely a year old. We spent some time in California, of which I can barely remember, then Louisiana, my dad's home state. But then by the time I was four, we had moved to Hawaii, on the island of Oahu to be specific. At first we lived on base housing, but my dad soon retired from active duty and thus we were upended and forced to find new jobs and a house. We ended up in one of those single-story duplexes that shared a common wall. We lived in the back apartment, where we had our own patio and a huge garden in the back that our landlord's wife took care of. The landlord lived in the front portion with a garage and a patio. I never knew this little tidbit of information until after I moved out, but apparently, her mother used to live in the section we lived in and had died there a very old and very happy woman. It was her garden and she had loved it and taken care of it like a child. Thus, we were always told to treat the garden with respect, which my brother and I did without question. In this house, it was mostly very quiet. There were little things here and there that I can remember. Footsteps in the grass in the evenings our dog barking for hours on end at something nobody could see in the backyard. A shadow of a little girl standing in the doorway to my brother and I's room, simply peeking in curiously. The only malicious and strange thing was the room that my brother and I shared, which was constantly, and I mean constantly, cold. It felt like there was an air conditioner on full blast in that room, but our house did not have an AC unit at all. Also, if my mom and I spent too much time in that room, we would get headaches that wouldn't leave until we left the house. But just because the house was odd didn't mean that it didn't spook the hell out of other people. Cue my brother's friend, Jay. As I knew Jay, he was a very open, friendly, fast-talking dude who loved to just be happy. I liked him a lot. Where my brother was smart-assed or introverted, Jay was outgoing and always willing to actually talk to me. A lot of the kids on my block were around my brother's age instead of mine, so I always tried to hang around him and his gang, which wasn't cool with him at all. Because A, I was the baby and couldn't keep up with the big boys, and B, it's not cool to let your sister tag along. It was always a boy's thing. But Jay never let any of those factors bother him and was always happy to hang out with me when the other guys wouldn't, so I knew him as a brother. Obviously, my brother had a lot of friends and we constantly had people over. This made my mom happy because she had always dreamed of having a lot of kids, so she sort of mothered and adopted each and every one of our friends. Our house sort of became the house everybody wanted to stay over at, so there was always somebody sleeping over well into our high school years. This story takes place while my brother and his friends were about 16 to 17. My brother had his first serious girlfriend and was constantly hanging out with her. When apart, calling her on the phone. Jay was staying the night. My brother was in the kitchen, which is mostly fenced in by walls and a half counter, talking to his girlfriend on the phone, while Jay was merely zoning out to music on the living room floor. All of a sudden, it gets cold. Not the whole room, either, but just a certain spot, to his side over an arm. Weirded out, he glances that way to see nothing. Then this spot starts moving, up his arm, over his neck, up to his mouth, and he describes it as the strangest sensation, like kissing a pair of frozen lips that aren't there. It's then he realizes something's not right, sits up, touches his lips, and looks around for whatever just kissed him. He finds nothing out of place, aside for a cold spot now a bit farther from him, close to where our couch was. He calls for my brother to come and check it out, as confirmation he's not imagining this cold thing. My brother comes around, still on the phone, and when he hovers his hand in that particular area, 
he seems pretty surprised to find it's remarkably cold. Now, here's where it gets really weird. At this point, Jay says my brother's face blanked out. His eyes glazed over, and he went limp so suddenly that he dropped the phone. John distinctly remembers hearing his girlfriend saying, Hello? Hello? Is anyone there? What's happening over there? Of course, my brother fell back onto the couch, and his lips were moving, but nothing really came out. Jay tries to snap my brother out of it, so he gets close and starts to shake him. That's when he can finally hear what my brother is saying. In a feminine voice that was definitely not my brother's, he was repeating, I'm sorry I did that. You just reminded me of someone I loved, over and over. When he gives him a particularly hard shake, my brother snaps out of it and seems relatively confused as to why he's on the couch and the phone is on the floor, why Jay looks so freaked out, and why the cold spot was no longer there. Anyway, my brother shrugged off the whole thing, laughed at Jay, called him a jokester, and quickly went back to talking with his girlfriend, with apologies and sweet nothings. Jay was shaken. He never spent the night at our house again after that. He said he felt like he was constantly being followed and watched in our house, and he always tried to make a point of not staying too long. This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was 21 years old, just finished basic training for the Air Force, and I didn't have my tech school for another six months, so the Air Force sent me home. While home in Hawaii, my parents decided to take me to Vietnam to visit, as I'm Vietnamese and my mom felt it was important for me to visit the motherland. On the trip, it was my parents, my four-year-old brother, and my best friend, Dan. For most of the trip, we did what normal tourists did. One of our destinations was the city of Kanto. It's a harbor city. Not thinking anything and never really believing in the supernatural, I was also excited to visit historical sites and stay at old hotels. We ended up staying at a hotel that was by a harbor. I don't remember the name of the hotel, but Dan and I shared a hotel room and my parents and little brother had the next room. I remember going to bed like it was any other ordinary day. I was dreaming, and I saw this figure laying on the bottom edge of my bed. This person was laid in the fetal position. For some reason, my eyes were focused on his feet, then started to slowly move up his body, and then I realized he was naked. Then I saw his face, and at that moment, I made eye contact with him, and he stared back at me. Once that happened, I began to have sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I could hear myself screaming, but nothing was coming out. I kept screaming, Dan, Dan, but he could not hear me. So I told myself to calm down and try to burst out, and that's what I did. It worked. I jumped up and woke Dan up. The first thing my friend asked me was why I was so pale. It looked like I'd seen a ghost, he said. I told him what happened. It freaked him out, and we ran to my mom's room and woke them up. My parents asked me what happened. As I was explaining to them what I had experienced, the curtains covering their window began to sway back and forth, and the lights in the room started flickering like crazy. My dad, who's a total skeptic, yelled, Leave my family alone. And it just stopped. After several minutes of talking and trying to understand what happened, we went to bed. Dan and I slept in their room on the extra bed. The next day we woke up and my parents were already downstairs eating breakfast. When I went downstairs, my mom greeted me and told me she had someone for me to talk to. It was the hotel manager. She had told him what had happened, and he told me, yeah, it happens a lot to people who are in the military. I was confused and asked why. 
He said this hotel had been built on top of what used to be an American hospital during the Vietnam War. And he said that they were trying to reach out to their comrades. I became a believer in the supernatural then, and have been ever since. My grandmother, or Tutu as we say in Hawaii, was the center of our entire family. She has always been the center of my life, and there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think of her, even 17 years after her death. She was of pure Hawaiian descent, and growing up with her as a child was supernatural in the biggest sense. I have many stories to share, all of them entirely true, and I will tell them to the best of my ability. All of them are deeply rooted in Hawaiian culture and spiritual beliefs, so please read this with an open mind, if you are not Kanaka Maoli. I have contemplated whether it was right to share this, but I find that this is my opportunity to share her with the world. She has had many experiences in her lifetime, which I have been gathering from my family members, but these are stories that I have had the honor to experience. I'll do my best to keep them short. Story number one, a fireball visits our home. In the year 1991, when I was just five years old, an akualele, or fireball, visited our home. Being so young at the time, I can only remember bits and pieces, but they have been validated by other family members who were there that night. My tutu and I were sitting in the living room watching television. This also served as her bedroom. There were beds all over the house, as from time to time, relatives would come to stay or sleep for the night. One of those dial switch TVs with only seven channels was our television. My older cousin was in his bedroom, which was near the living room. All of a sudden, I heard my cousin yelling for my grandma. He runs into the living room. Toot, what is that? He points out the window, which was just behind the TV. I sat up and went to the window and peeked in between the jalouses. What I saw, I could never forget. A ball of fire was moving above the mango trees in our backyard. It was literally gliding over the trees and toward the windows. I remember how bright it was. It had a long black tail trailing behind it, with sparks of red flickering around it. It was big, and it was loud. I have never seen something like this before. I thought it had come from the sky. As it got closer, I felt the hands of my grandma wrap around my chest as she pulled me away from the window. Her voice was filled with raspiness, and she shouts, Akualele. She yells to my cousin, Grab the salt. Go now. My cousin runs to the kitchen and grabs a big bag of Hawaiian salt and begins throwing it out of the bag. I remember feeling the big rocks hitting the back of my legs. I slid behind my grandma as the fireball began ducking back and forth between the two windows, as if it was trying to get a look at us. The next thing I remember is her cursing at the thing in Hawaiian. She shouts louder and louder and louder, until the thing stops and explodes right in front of my eyes. It was just one loud pop, and then it was gone. Years later, as my cousin and I were recalling the story, he explains to me that the Akualele was sent to us from another Hawaiian family who lived farther down the road. The grandmother of their family was jealous of my grandmother as we had recently obtained more land to expand our coffee farm. What I didn't remember was that I fell deathly ill for the next two days, and my grandmother only left my side once to go talk to the family so they could come to an agreement. After giving offerings and sharing each other's breath, she returned home to find her granddaughter alive and well, as if I had never been sick at all. Story number two, the Aumakua, that saved my uncle. This happened in the year 1995, when I was just nine years old. 
The best thing about where I lived, which was in Captain Cook, South Kona, was that many of my family lived on the same road. I had a girl cousin who lived a five minute walk from our home, past my uncle and auntie's house and through a grove of banana trees and thick elephant grass. Yeah, ouch. I would spend the night there a lot. She was like my best friend. One night, I arrived there as the sun was going down. She was outside on her front porch, crying. Her sister was draped over her body, and they were consoling each other over something. I ran up to her and asked what was wrong. She says, it's my dad, he's sick. I went up the stairs and was about to enter the living room when my aunt peeked her head out of the bedroom door, warning me to stay outside. I began to cry, as any child my age would do in an unknown situation like that. I asked what was wrong, but could already hear the moans and wails coming out of my uncle's lips. His father was a Filipino man, and he was sitting on his usual rocking chair, this time holding a bowl in his two hands, hovering over it, examining it. I went to him to examine it myself. As I passed the walkway into the living room, I peeked into my uncle's room. My auntie was wringing out a towel over his head. The bed sheets were covered in his sweat. He wasn't moving, and he was barely breathing. His father was holding a bowl of water. In the bottom of the bowl was a thin layer of raw white rice. He points to the two flecks of rice floating at the top of the water. Oh no, no good, no can help my boy, he says in his constant broken English. He looks up to finally notice that I was there. He grabs my arm tightly as if to show me that I need to listen now with the utmost importance. Go to your tutu, bring her now. My boy going make. I ran back to our house and I remember the feeling of my lungs just ripping out of my chest. I ran into the living room and called out to my grandma, Tutu, come, it's Uncle Dickie, which was short for Richard. I ran back outside as my grandmother got up. She took a machete and chopped down a bundle of tea leaves. My grandmother starts up the work truck and we take off toward my cousin's house. My grandmother goes into the living room. My Filipino uncle stays silent. I remember sitting outside with my cousins trying to console them in their grief. We sat on the side of the porch, our legs dangling between the railings. I could hear my uncle muttering in tongues as my grandmother prayed for Almakua to come. Almakua stands for spiritual guardian, which are usually manifested into animals. Every person of Hawaiian descent knows which Almakua relates to their bloodline, and I'm sure many have a story to tell of when they have come to provide aid. Yes, it's true, and it would become true to me now. As we were wiping the tears from our eyes, just a moment to breathe back the sobs, I heard a screech. In front of her house was the unpaved road. There was just one street light over the telephone wires running down the side of the road. I looked toward the direction of the screech and could see a small shadow flying toward the telephone wires. I tapped on my cousin's shoulder and begged her to look. It was a Hawaiian owl, a pueo. It perched up on the wire and just looked at us. All three of us were caught in a trance and a feeling of calm swept over me. That's when another one came and perched right beside the first one. Well, that's odd. They spend their lives in solitude. Maybe they were a pair. Just as soon as the second one came, there came another, and then another, two sets of two. What a sight to see, I thought. In the midst of what was happening at the moment, we found happiness. My cousin begins to giggle a little as she gets up to tell her mom what was happening. Just as soon as she gets up to turn around, she lets out a small sigh. We look up to see that her head had bumped into her father's chest. He holds his daughter in his arms as she begins to scream. Baby, what is it? What are you all staring at? We stared at him, our eyes as big as a mempachi fish. 
As we turned around to look back at the telephone wire, the owls were gone. My uncle says to us, don't worry, I saw them too. But how? Just a half an hour ago, we thought he was doomed for death. He tells his family, I saw them in my dream. Up there on the telephone wire, yeah? I looked deep into the eyes of one, and that's when I woke up. What is it? Why are you all staring at me? Story number three. My grandmother's funeral. I apologize in advance for bringing out two great stories just to hit you with the inevitable fact that my grandmother's life came to an end. It was the biggest tragedy in my life, and for some reason I can't come to grips with it. Maybe it's because she's still with me. She was the caretaker and kahuna figure of my family, and that didn't end in her death if that makes you feel any better. Or maybe it confuses you. Well. It was the year 1999 in the month of March when my tutu had passed. My grandfather had died just two months earlier. She died of a broken heart, no reason to live anymore. Her funeral service was held at our local church in Keala Kekua. I spent the whole time next to her open coffin, just waiting for her to move, to say something. Please wake up, tutu, I still need you, I say. The church was packed to the ceiling. So many relatives, so many friends. She meant everything to everyone. The only one I noticed that wasn't there was my uncle, my father's brother. It was just the two of them with a string of Hanai, or adopted brothers and sisters who would carry out the coffin at the end of the ceremony. We were trapped in eternity during the service, but I begged it not to stop. The casket was finally closed and all the Hawaiian aunts and uncles wept, as it was custom to cry loud enough for the heavens to hear. The men in the family all took their places at the coffin and lifted my grandmother off the frame, all with one spot left vacant. They walked down the small stairs and through the short walkway to the hearse. My father was at the back. My mother, sister, brother, and I were right behind at the front of the line. As soon as his foot left the sacred area of the chapel, I saw my uncles buckle as they dropped the coffin to the ground. They began looking at each other, finding a time to laugh, saying, Come on, brah, no get weak on me now. They stooped back down to pick the coffin up. I literally watched five of the strongest men in my entire family struggling to pick my grandmother up. Cries and whispers start floating around the chapel as they attempt over and over to raise her coffin off the ground. It would not move. They could not move her. My father explained that the coffin was heavier than blue rock. My father and my uncle lean down at the front of the coffin and peek open the door that was to be forever closed. I could hear my father talking to his mother. Ma, it's time to go. What are you waiting for? As they continued pleading with my dead grandmother, I heard the rumbling of an engine racing up the driveway of the church. It was my uncle, late as usual, even to his own mother's funeral. Real Hawaiian time, as we would say. He puts on his white gloves and kneels in front of the pastor, apologizing for his tardiness. Why he was late, I don't know. But as he took his place at the coffin, across from my father. They lifted the coffin once again. My grandmother's coffin floated off the ground, light as a feather, they said. They walked another 15 steps or so to the hearse. They said it was like my grandmother floated to the car. Even in her death, she was still as strong as ever, refusing to leave this world without her two boys by her side to lead her to the next. Story number four. Grandmother and grandfather hear my father's plea for help. Yes, there is a story number four. How, you may ask? As I said before, her guardianship does not end in her death. How comforting, yeah? This took place two years after my grandparents had passed. This one involves my father and mother, and every time he tells the story, the facts never change. My parents had gone to Hilo for the weekend on the other side of the island. We have family in Keakaha that they would visit from time to time. 
Now, geez, that's another chapter right there. But anyway, my father and mother decide to spend the night at Hilo Seaside Hotel, right down the road. My father himself, being half Hawaiian and half Filipino, always had a sick sense. And sometimes it was a nightmare, as it started that way that night. It was around 2.30 in the morning, and they were sleeping in room number 102, queen-size bed. The room was small, and the door to the room was real close to the bed. If you open the door and walk to the right, it leads you down a flight of stairs, across a small garden area, through a swinging gate, and into the parking lot. My father was being visited once again, by a choking ghost. This has happened to him on many occasions in his life, but as he tells me to this day, it was one of his last encounters. As the clock reads 2.36 a.m., he is woken up by a feeling of fear in the pit of his stomach. He could see a shadow forming at the foot of the door. The shadow leaks under the crack of the door and up the door onto the ceiling. He began rubbing his eyes to adjust to the darkness, the tint of yellow light coming through the sliding glass door on the other side of the bed. My mother was sound asleep. He thought for a second of waking her. As he looked closer and closer at the shadow, it began to take the shape of a womanly form. Only now the shape was that of a gecko crawling on the wall, the arms and legs bent out and away from the center of the body. He was disgusted as this thing begins crawling on the ceiling, making its way above the bed. As soon as it is hovering over my father, it drops from the ceiling and lands on his chest. This womanly creature had a face, he said, a horrible face with a slithering tongue. It wraps its legs around my father's stomach, and the hands grasp his arms, holding him down on the bed. He was frozen in fear as he attempted to wake my mother from her sleep. My mother is of Caucasian descent, so she was usually not as affected by these things as my father was. The womanly creature stares directly into his eyes. He says it was just grinning at him as he began to feel his throat tighten and his esophagus lock up. He was gasping for breath as he tried his best to get this thing off. The creature began shrieking as he was slipping in and out of consciousness. He said he felt as if he was taking his last breath when all of a sudden the door swings open. There was another shadow standing inside the frame of the door. As it walked into the room, the yellow light hit the face, the face of my grandmother. He hears his mother shout, Aole mamake, you cannot have my son. She begins cursing at the thing. Even though the thing was still on my father's chest, he was bewildered at the fact that his dead mother was standing in front of him as if her flesh were still real. There was a bright light coming from behind her. As my grandmother continued to curse and curse at the thing in Hawaiian, it finally let off and scampered off, dissipating into the sliding glass door. My father could not take his eyes off his mother, but she doesn't say a word to him, just stares at him for a few seconds, smiling. She turns around and walks out of the room and out the door of their hotel room. This is when my mother wakes up. Even if you were to put my parents into separate rooms, they would still recall the same story. My mother joins my father at the door, asking him what's going on. My dad was staring down the corridor where the stairs were. That's when my mother's eyes focused on my grandmother, who was still walking. She walked down the steps and past the garden. She looked as alive as ever. No more limping, no more pain as she walked. She walks out the swinging gate into the parking lot. That's when they realized that she was walking to a parked car at the corner, facing out toward the front street of the hotel. The brake lights were glowing red, but he could make out the blue bumper of his father's 62 Mazda. In the reflection of the rear view mirror, he could see his father's face. He was right there, sitting in the driver's seat of the car, they watched as my grandmother approached the car, saying to him, Okay, Papa, we go now. Our boy is okay. She gets into the passenger seat. They remember watching the glowing of the brake lights as the car disappeared into the darkness. So, there you have it.
I hope this gave you an ounce of insight into the wonderful woman that my grandmother is. And for you, Kanaka Maoli, an insight into the wonderful people that all of our Tutuhine and Tutukane are. And if you still have the fortune of having them here in this world right now, don't take another second for granted. Because with them, they take our past, our tradition, and our inherent right to be proud of who we are. Please take this chance to ask them as much as you can, jot it down, and share it with the rest of the world before it's gone. I've witnessed paranormal activity since the age of seven. I'm 26 now, and I experience this activity wherever I go. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12. I was seven. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but I'll tell some of the shorter stories now. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person, crawling on all fours with dislocated joints coming down the hallway, wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name, thinking it was me trying to scare her. But that's when she saw that I poked my head out of the day room. Her face completely lost color. She had me go into my room and dig out the Halloween mask. It was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said that the figure was wearing it and that she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit when she looked closely at him. She could see that his skin was pale and it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. My dog started to whimper and cry, and before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male's voice breathe heavily in my ear and then exhale. My dog then proceeded to freak out and bark. I could probably write a thick chapter book with all the things that I have seen, but hopefully these stories interest you. On my mother's side, there was a story that's been told since I was a kid. It was even told before me to my older siblings, my cousins, and even my younger aunts and uncles. It is somewhat of a ghost story, but as some family stories go, the times and details get muddy. When the story was first told to me, it took place in the early 1920s, and here is how it goes. A family member, it varied from great-grandmother to great-grand-aunt, well, she was a little kid, and her family was traveling and decided to pull over and picnic and camp for the night. I always assumed they were part of the Dust Bowl movement because the story was as they were heading to California. The story goes that during the night, the little girl, my great-grandmother or great-grand-aunt, hears screaming and yelling. She runs and hides and looks out from behind a tree and she witnesses her entire family being axed to death. The lore was that if you went to the site and camped there, you could still hear their screams and that nobody ever caught the killer. Fast forward to a couple of years ago through Ancestry.com and researching my family history. I confirmed with a great uncle the truth of our family story. My great-great-grandmother was a survivor of the Apache Massacre in New Mexico. I ended up visiting the site, and there's a wiki page about the 1861 massacre where they attacked settlers that were on their way to California. 
My family's wagon train was crossing the area, and my great-great-grandmother's family were all killed. She was the only survivor from the family and ended up being adopted by a local family. Our family name was lost as she was so small she didn't remember it. The story was that her mother hid her so she wouldn't be killed. She was later found by a garrison militia in the area and turned over to the Catholic Church nearby. One night, an uncle of mine was walking home. The sun was just starting to set, and in Lagos at the time, there weren't many street lights. So when it got dark out, it got dark out. My uncle had been told by my abu, my dad's mom, many times not to stay out too late and to always be home before the sun goes down. My uncle was a very stubborn person when he was younger, according to my dad, and always blew off everything that my abu would say. On this night, he definitely should have listened to her. And if I'm not mistaken, he did after these events happened. As he was out walking, he saw a man standing on a street corner. The man looked at my uncle and said, you should get home, kid, it's getting late. My uncle, being the jackass he was, said, screw you, old man, don't tell me what to do, and went about his leisurely walk home. After a couple of blocks, my uncle saw the same man standing on a different street corner. The man said the same thing as he did before. My uncle didn't think much of it and told him to go F himself and continued walking. After a few blocks, my uncle saw the same man yet again, but this time he had a big snarling dog with him. The old man said the same thing, this time with the dog growling and baring its teeth. My uncle was a little more bothered this time, understandably so, but still told the old man to shove it and kept walking. He was nearly home at this point, the sun was gone, the moon bright in the sky. And then he sees him again, and this time he's just laughing maniacally. Not only is he laughing, but he has two dogs now. According to my dad, my uncle said that the dogs and man's eyes were red, and as soon as my uncle walked past them, he heard the man let the dogs go. He took off running as fast as he possibly could, the dogs barking, snarling, and giving chase. As soon as my uncle reached my abu's house, he started pounding on the door furiously, begging her to open up. Once the door was opened, he flew inside and told her to shut it fast. My abu was trying to figure out what was happening, and my uncle told her about the man and the dogs. My abu said that he was being ridiculous and that there was nothing out there. She opened the door and saw nothing. But my uncle swore that he could see the dogs pacing outside back and forth, teeth sharp, eyes red, fur black, and waiting for him. My grandma is from Olancho, Honduras. In the old days, the only way to reach her area was through plane because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel by car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Remember this. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason being, we were going to drive to Florida. It was going to be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room. I had to go to the bathroom, so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door of the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see it, even though it wasn't dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity, but for some reason, there was no switch. So I turned my head toward the left, where there was a hallway toward the bathroom. I walked toward the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. 
Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were just adjusting after waking up, so I walked toward the switch, but as soon as I did, the figure walked toward me. I got scared and walked faster toward the switch, and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the light, it would go away, so I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split second after I turned the lights on. I didn't say anything to anybody because I just knew that nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida. We all played songs and told stories, and one story that my aunt told us revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador. She said that the palm reader told her her future and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with the other woman to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother, who happened to be a voodoo priestess, and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat what the woman had told her about the curse. Quote, Your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It is a black figure with no face. It will not harm you, but it will let you know that it's there. I freaked out. I said BS and I told her to tell me she was lying. Then I told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was pretty quiet after that. A couple of years after this, my brother saw the same figure on my bed. But that's another story for another day. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of the house and out of town, and I rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had lots of time on her hands, and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying. The woman, who literally had no life besides trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing a lot of weird things. I would wake up and find her watching me sleep. She stole my sunglasses, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and trolling me in real life. However, she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch despite my interest in spirituality and tarot, I actually don't believe in witches or witchcraft, but nonetheless, she claimed to be one. I think the spells work on a belief system that causes a domino effect of either positive or negative things occurring. Either way, no matter. I decided I had had enough of tolerating her BS and I moved out. That resulted in her stalking me. She turned up twice to my workplaces, staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police. Then she tried to cyber stalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. Eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. But again, whenever I tried to get up or turn the light on, it would vanish. One night, I woke up to it standing there like usual, but I could see a creepy woman's face on it. It was smiling at me. I told it to F off, and it vanished. For a while, I didn't see the thing, but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they were coming from. I would find them on my arms, my chest, my hips, my thighs. One night I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something had bit me. Instead, I found scratches on my shoulder and back, like somebody had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me, and I even visited a doctor who just accused me of self-harm. I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out where these scratches were coming from. The last incident occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over onto my side. I felt air on my face. I originally ignored it, until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. 
I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet, like someone had killed her and then left her in water to rot. Her body was coming out from underneath the bed, while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed, and I was too scared to get off the bed. So, like a little kid, I covered my face with a blanket, and I started saying prayers and waited until morning. After that, it never came back, and all the scratches healed. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time, and was somehow scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I don't believe in spells and whatever, but whatever it was wanted to pose as a female, and I think it was part of my loser ex-housemate's nonsense, like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something she had sent after me. I don't really know what it was, but I haven't seen it in a long time, so... As long as it stays that way, I guess it's all good. This occurred over 20 years ago, but it's still fresh on my mind. My son was born early. We were lucky, and he had a few issues, but we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room. And before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from this room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head, as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had just come into the room, only to turn and find out that I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say, peekaboo, when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so little that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman. I would find this woman in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left-hand side. I was asleep, and I was woken up by being shaken roughly. I woke up and looked over at my husband, and I said, Why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and he was on the wrong side from where I was shaken from. I immediately jumped up and ran into my son's room. I flipped the light on, something I had never done up until this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you just need to startle them and they will begin again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and strange occurrences with the pets and toys continued, until my son came off of the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pet stopped acting weird, and the Big Bird toy never went off on its own again. I believe that someone came home with him to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, I'll always be grateful for her watching over him and shaking me awake that night 
so that I could startle my son into breathing again. I'm going to assume that most people who hear this story have watched or heard of the movie Interstellar. If not, then you must know about a particular aspect of the movie before I tell you this story. There are spoilers. Throughout the movie, one of the characters has multiple paranormal experiences in her room with what she calls a ghost. This ghost is later revealed to actually be her dad, which through some very complicated events, was able to interact with certain objects and forces like gravity in her room when he's inside a black hole somewhere out in space. So a while ago, my brother and both my parents and I were watching Interstellar. I had been trying to find an open slot in everyone's schedules to watch this movie together for a long time and had finally succeeded. We watched the whole movie and at the end of it, we were all discussing how good of a moment was when Cooper found out that his daughter had figured out that he was her ghost. Just as we step out of the living room after watching the movie, we hear a noise coming from the kitchen. We locate the source of the noise and it's an old phone that we had forgotten we even had underneath a pile of old magazines. It was ringing a loud alarm and displayed a low battery message on the screen. The thing is, we hadn't charged this phone for years. At least five years had passed since we had last charged this phone, and yet it was turned on and ringing for a few minutes. We all started laughing and jokingly said it was our ghost wanting to communicate with us. Watching the movie together was such an amazing family moment, and then something like this happens? I don't know. I just found it thought-provoking enough to share. My dad died the day that my daughter turned 10 months old. She's slept through the night with no issues since around five months. But the night he died at 2 a.m., she suddenly cried out. My husband and I have a baby monitor with sound and visuals, so we pulled up the camera feed to see if it was her waking up or just a sound in her sleep. We saw her standing in her crib, smiling and giggling at the side. She kept pointing to her toys and books and babbling away like she was playing. We just watched. I had just hung up the phone with my mom who was calling from the hospital, so I knew exactly who she was talking to. After a few minutes, she waved, curled up on her tummy, and went back to sleep. Now, several months later, we were having a particularly rough day with tantrums and being cranky. As I sat her down and walked off to grab a snack for her, I heard my dad's voice, clear as ever, say, Hey, behind me. I stopped walking and whipped around so fast I nearly fell to my knees. She immediately stopped crying and turned her head in the direction it had come from. Then she kept her gaze there and didn't cry again while I finished getting her food. I knew that I didn't imagine it if she had reacted to it as well. My dad still visits my daughter, his only grandchild, and it couldn't make me any happier. When I was younger, I had an imaginary friend. We would color together, watch TV, dance, sing. My mother thought that it was normal for a five-year-old, so nothing more was made of it. When I was 10 years old, I walked in on my mother flipping through an old family photo album of black and white pictures from the 60s. She came across one that looked exactly like my imaginary friend. I told my mom, hey, that's the girl I play with. My mom turned white as a ghost. She tried to ignore it until she turned a couple of pages again and I pointed it out again saying, look, there she is again. My mom then told me that the little girl in the photos was her sister who had died in the bedroom that was now mine. I learned her name, her age, and so much more about her. 
she's still around 14 years later. I feel her presence a few times a week, and she enters my dreams sometimes to talk to me. When I meditate, she will make an effort to communicate with me as well. I own some of her things from when she was alive. A watch, her library card, a hair bow, her kindergarten diploma, and a little doll. I adore her, and I hope she sticks around until my end comes too. I've come here because where I am right now, it's four in the morning, and the only person I know awake doesn't believe me. My cat was crying at me, like she usually does when she's hungry. So I took her downstairs to get her something to eat. But on the way back upstairs, I looked into my living room, and I swear in the top left corner of the door frame, there was this white face that looked straight at me and then moved behind the wall where I couldn't see it. I practically fell over on my way back upstairs, scared out of my mind. I called a friend who responded with, I didn't ask. I'm still sitting in my room with the light on. Nothing like this has happened before, and I'm quite frankly terrified. Like, what do I do? I'm usually quite skeptical when it comes to things like this, but I can't deny what just happened. To be honest, I think I'm just telling you out of the stress, and I needed someone to acknowledge what just happened to me. What on earth do I do? I live with my parents in a house built in the 1890s. We moved here around eight years ago, and there have been creepy things going on almost every week since we got here. A cousin of mine said she saw a little girl in a white dress stare at her from behind a corner. Things have been moving around seemingly by themselves, and I often hear the faint sound of two people talking during the night, almost as if a TV is turned on downstairs, but it's always off. Yesterday, I was at home alone, sitting in my room studying. As you sometimes have to do, I passed a little wind, and right after that, I heard what sounded like a little girl giggling in my closet for three or four seconds. I should add that it sounded like she forced herself to stay quiet. Regardless, there were no children, and it really frightened me. Like I said, I was home alone. No computers or TVs were turned on at the moment. I went outside to take a walk until my parents came home. For context, I've been watching a lot of BuzzFeed paranormal videos because they're entertaining but they also remind me of everything paranormal that I've ever been through. I like to remember my experiences, to relate to the experiences that they're talking about. But tonight, I made a realization that made goosebumps shoot down my arms. I've always had a strange reaction to specifically the paranormal. I'm a 20-year-old man that has only really cried when an extreme emotional event happens. Hard breakups, a death in the family, something like that. But whenever I hear something unreasonably paranormal, my eyes randomly produce tears. It could be a ghost story, someone talking about an experience they had, whatever. I don't feel scared at all. I actually feel calm with a slight feeling of being unnerved. I really don't understand why this happens. Keep this in mind because it kind of ties into this. I've always had a weak immune system and it was worse as a kid. This one time, I was incredibly sick and bedridden to the point of hallucination. I saw a hawk fly into my window that didn't exist. But most notably, I saw a full-scale apparition. I mean, it didn't even look like a traditional ghost. It wasn't see-through, it wasn't staring at me, or talking to me, or anything. If I could describe it, 
It was like when the white blood cells travel across your eye as it moves that way. The apparition had long flowing blonde hair, flowing as if she were underwater. Weird because I'm studying to be a marine biologist and most likely will have a job close to the sea, but I digress. She was wearing a wedding dress and as soon as I saw her, the instantaneous thought in my mind was, I will marry this woman one day. The apparition then faded through the door and disappeared. Pretty creepy, but I chalked it up to being delusional thoughts of a child that's incredibly sick. Fast forward at least six years. I have a shelf on my wall that holds nerd things. In particular, a bottle of Juggernog from the Call of Duty series. I get up from my bed to do something, and I notice that the bottle is missing from the shelf. As soon as I realize this, the bottle comes zooming past my head from behind me, as if somebody had thrown it. It doesn't shatter, it just hits the carpet, but I remember it spinning past my head. There is zero possibility that it dropped from the shelf. I was standing at least two feet away from it, and it landed nowhere near where it would land even if it had fallen off. If it had, it would have fallen on my desk below the shelf and shattered. I was calm, without having any reason to be. I checked my closet, which was the direction that it had come from. Nothing. My mind went, intruder in my closet. Nope, okay. I placed the bottle back on the shelf and walked away. My intense realization was that the ghost woman in the wedding dress disappeared in the exact same location that the bottle would have been thrown from. And both times I was incredibly calm even though I had experienced someone throwing something at me, as well as seeing a full-scale apparition. This time, I wasn't really sick at all. I don't know what to make of this realization. I am out of the house, as it's my parents' house, and nothing else malicious has ever happened to us, so I'm not really worried. This is one of the many strange occurrences that happened in that house, but nothing else is really worth mentioning. I just wanted to share this story to people who might find it interesting. I grew up in a strange house. There were numerous odd things that happened over the years, but this one is the one that I'll mention today. It's pretty short, but I still find it really interesting. I had my dresser inside my closet and was in the middle of cleaning it out. Out of nowhere in my 20 by 15 foot bedroom, I hear the sound of a single loud hand clap. There was that tinny reverb sound that you hear when you clap in an empty room. There was nothing that fell on the floor that could have made that sound, or any obvious explanation that I could find. I remember kind of morphing into that, well, that was odd and totally inexplicable, let's just move along now, kind of avoidance afterwards. For some reason, of all the things that I heard in that room, in that house, that single hand clap while I was all alone still brings chills to my spine. I was at work today doing my normal deliveries when I kept seeing a lady with long black hair and a white dress and nothing else in my side mirror at multiple stops on my route. I quickly figured out that it was a spirit because who's going to be following a van around in 20 degree weather wearing just a thin dress? Also, some of my stops were half a mile apart. I couldn't see her face except for her mouth. I decided just to ignore her for the time being until something happened. About 10 stops later, I go to get out the sliding door when she's standing about a foot away from the van, directly in front of me. Her jaw opens inhumanly wide, like to the middle of her chest wide, and she screams at me. It felt like she shook my entire essence, if that makes any sense. Since then, my chest has been kind of hurting. It's been about three hours since that happened, and the pain has eased up a bit, so I think I'm good there. I'm just 
kind of freaked out at this point. I tried looking up some information, but I have come up empty. Except for references to Destiny 2 and a B-horror movie from the 90s. I've dealt with my fair share of weird things, but this is something else. Any information or advice would be greatly appreciated. My dad moved into a house in the middle of the woods about two years ago, and I moved in with him soon after to help him get around and take care of the house and whatnot. Side note, it's an old house on land that has a deep Native American history in the South. Honestly, this house is really weird. The first night I spent here, I was woken up by a woman whispering, is anyone home? Right next to me as I was about to fall asleep. My dad didn't believe me when I told him the next day. It's taken a while to get used to living in the deep woods, but something about this property is just off. There have been more than a few times where I've actually felt a heavy presence, almost like someone is standing right behind me. I have a cat who I rely on to alert me when there's someone approaching my room, and there have been times where he's alerted me but nobody was there. Other times, he stares at the same corner of my room with an expression that tells me he can see something I can't. There have been more times I can count where I'll be leaving a room and a cabinet will slam, where it sounds like something was moved behind me. It sounds silly, but it's odd enough for me to notice. I've mentioned it to my father, but he didn't think much of it. Until early this morning. He woke up and went downstairs to find the basement flooded. Somehow, the shower in the basement was turned on and the drain had been clogged. Neither of us used the shower in the basement. He's now fully convinced that there's a ghost in the house. I don't know. If you ask me, I think it's more than the house. I get that feeling even when I'm out on a hike. I always leave food scraps and leftovers out on the tree line for the animals and sometimes coincidentally find little treasures in the same spot, almost like I made a trade with Mother Nature. Once I left strawberry cake leftovers out, and the next day I found a stone with a pink crystal formation. Another time I found an arrowhead carved out of stone. It's really interesting, and I just thought I'd share. It was late afternoon a couple of days ago, and I went to put my two-week-old baby girl down for a nap in her bedroom. I had been up all night taking care of her, and I had been doing laundry and other chores all morning, so I was pretty tired myself. My husband ran to the store to get some groceries, so I decided to take a nap while Natalia was sleeping. I grabbed the baby monitor and went to lay down in our bedroom across the hall. I always make sure I grab the baby monitor whenever I'm going to lay down, since I have two sleeping disorders and I sleep hard, so I don't always hear her cries when she needs something. Anyway, I decided to read a little bit before napping. All of a sudden, I hear a bunch of static coming from the baby monitor. I ignored it and continued reading, figuring that as long as my daughter wasn't crying, I could just ignore the noise. Amanda! Amanda! I heard a kid's voice quietly say the name over the baby monitor. I froze. Did I really just hear a child call me over the baby monitor? I instantly felt creeped out and like something or someone was watching me. Scared, I ignored the voice. I heard the static again and the same voice say, come here. Still very creeped out, I went across the hall to my baby's room. I saw my sweet girl laying in her bassinet, quietly looking at me walk through the door, almost as though she was waiting for me to come to get her. Quickly, I grabbed my daughter and left the room. I'm not sure if she was communicating to me through the baby monitor somehow. As I mentioned earlier, I do have two sleep disorders, so I'm not always very good at hearing her cries when I'm sleeping, so I'm not sure if this was a way of her signaling to me that she needed something before I fell asleep. 
but I don't think she could really say my name. Maybe there was something in her room that was communicating to me. And plus, I was reading. I wasn't even asleep yet. I've never felt any malevolent spirits in our home, but I did feel on edge after that experience a couple of days ago. I haven't experienced anything else since, though. I just have no explanation for what that was. I don't particularly believe in the paranormal, but I don't know if there's another explanation for this one. On a weekday, during the time of the lockdown, this was the time when students had to do all of their schoolwork from home, I was half asleep in bed and didn't get up for school, considering the fact that my alarm didn't go off. I laid there in bed for a while until I heard a knock at my bedroom door. I don't know the specific number of knocks, if that's relevant, but I know that I heard a woman's voice talking to me. Cody, wake up. It's 8.30. I assumed it was my mom because she's the only lady in the house. I looked at my phone to check. It was 7.30, an hour before I had to wake up to start school. I was still dazed from laying there for so long, so I replied, Ma, I still have an hour. About an hour later, I went to the table for breakfast. And when my mom walked in the room, I brought it up. She looked at me, confused, and then answered my question. I never went to your door. I was walking the dog at that time, like I always do. This was when it hit me. That female voice at the door didn't sound anything like my mom. I had just assumed it was her. I shrugged it off by the time I had to show up for class. But during the break between the Zoom meetings, I soon realized something. Whoever that was, why and how did she know my name? Later, when all my classes were done, I told my family what had happened. My older brother just brushed it off and said I was probably still dreaming, which didn't make much sense because it felt so real, and everything I came into contact with, I could feel. Meanwhile, my dad just frowned at me. Did you respond to it? That's all he asked, and when I confirmed I did, he went on a rant about spirits and ghosts. My dad very much believes in this type of thing, and whenever we bring up this topic, he always mentions that he has a sixth sense. All he told me was that it's a bad thing that I responded, and it's even worse that whatever it was knew my name. So, yeah, that happened. I just find it odd that whoever or whatever this thing was only did it once and never came back. So, I guess I'll add some context before the story. I live in a 100-year-old building, though it was used as storage for the connected storefront for around 80 of those years. It was only made into separate apartments within the last 20 or so years. Only three tenants, including myself, have lived here since, and everyone's still kicking. My boyfriend recently moved in, and he's one of those people who does believe in ghosts and spirits and demons and all that. I don't, but yet here I am. He said since he moved into the place that it's haunted. I'm like, okay, whatever, I have gaming to do. But then there was today. Today, it was dead silent. My boyfriend was sleeping on the other end of the apartment. No TV, no radio, no computer, nothing on to make any noise. The neighbors from downstairs are on vacation, and the snow outside has not been disturbed, so nobody's come around. I walked into my bathroom, and clear as day, as though it was right in front of me, I hear, um, hello? As though I had walked in on a woman in the shower. My shower curtain is see-through, so obviously I turn around and there's nothing to be seen. I sat and listened for a while, now, sometimes we can hear the downstairs neighbors making loud noises, but never like they're in the same room, and like I said, they weren't home anyway. No other sounds came. I woke my boyfriend and I asked him about this thing haunting the apartment, and he said that it was feminine and that it has spent time in the bathroom before. 
I don't know what he sees or feels, but I just let him do his thing. I found it eerie. I thought I would post it here and see if anybody has a rational explanation. I don't believe in ghosts, but who knows? Also, I didn't have my phone with me, so it wasn't coming from my cell phone either. These incidents occurred when my boyfriend and I lived in Dixon, California, a few years ago. The house wasn't very old, given that the town is home to the oldest running fair on the west coast, but we weren't in the newest part of town either. As far as I know, nobody ever died in the house. Our first week in the house, I was using the bathroom while my boyfriend and our roommate were in the garage. It was about 3 or 4 p.m., I got a really weird feeling, so I just tried to hurry up. I felt panicked, but I assumed that it was a panic attack. I have a diagnosis for a panic condition, so it made sense. I went out of the bathroom and turned left to go into the garage, when I almost ran smack into a shadowy figure of a woman about my height. Honestly, all I remember was hair and shadow, because before it even registered in my conscious mind, my flight instinct had me running the opposite way and out the front door. I told the guys what happened and they kind of nodded, cracked a few jokes, and then we all continued whatever we were going to do. Fast forward a few months later. I'm home alone, just finished cleaning my room, and was waiting for my boyfriend to come home with dinner. My dogs were both in the room with me, and I had closed the door but left it slightly ajar. I heard faint footsteps come down the hall and I got the sense that we weren't alone. My dogs also looked at the door. It slowly opened just a little bit more when the footsteps stopped. It felt more curious than anything, so I stated firmly that this was my room, and if you have kind intentions, then you are more than welcome to come hang out with us, but good vibes only. I then padded at the end of my bed and went back to my phone. After a minute or so, I felt something sit on my bed, looked up, smiled, and said, good vibes to you as well. It felt very peaceful, so I went back to my phone. Ten minutes later, the weight on my bed lifted, and I could feel footsteps across the floor, going toward the door. My dogs pricked up and ran out the door. I didn't feel weird, so I just said out loud, thanks for hanging out and not making it weird, and I went back to my phone. About five minutes after that, I hear my front door open and I hear my boyfriend come inside. He didn't say hello or acknowledge me, which was kind of out of the ordinary. I walked out, excited to tell him about my ghost experience. As soon as I finished my story, he looks at me funny and goes, So that wasn't you in the front window when I got here? I looked at him weird and told him that I'd been in my room the whole time. He told me that he had parked and was sending a text to his dad when he looked over and saw what he assumed to be me, since it was definitely a woman, looking through a slightly pulled back curtain. As soon as he looked, the figure let the curtain drop. He thought that I was watching him for whatever reason, so when he came inside, he fully expected me to be on the couch, but when he saw that I was in my room, he got pissy about it. We both agreed that it had to be the ghost, I was the only woman living in the house at the time. Another weird thing about the house was that during the day, while my boyfriend and roommates were at work, I would randomly hear somebody washing dishes. Sometimes I would sigh in relief and think that my slobbish roommate was finally doing his dishes. He always let them pile up in the sink. When I would later go out and expect to see a clean sink in the kitchen, I would be very confused to see that the dishes had not been touched. Not a single one. Yet, here I had heard clear as day somebody doing dishes in our kitchen. We've never had any negative encounters, save for the semi-scary first time that I saw her. I would like to think that she was the best roommate we ever had. I definitely felt nothing but peace whenever I would feel her presence in the house after our good vibes conversation. So I guess it's not really scary, but it definitely was a haunting. We look back fondly on it, and... I'm glad I had the experience. In 
Is there such a thing as a good haunting? I think that's what's happening to me. I think my grandmother is haunting me, but in a good way. I don't know. I guess some backstory is required. I come from a very superstitious Irish Catholic family. So superstitious that my father would pitch a fit if somebody was sitting in his spot when the Steelers played on Sunday afternoons, or that my aunt would always throw a pinch of salt over her shoulder while cooking so as not to ruin the meal. All of this superstitious behavior was passed down from my grandmother, who all the grandkids affectionately called Nanny, and moreover from her father. Now, I never met my pop-pop Martin. He died long before I was born, but his stories have been told to me and the rest of my cousins by Nanny and our great aunts. Pop-Pop Martin and Mom-Mom Martin had seven daughters, my nanny being the oldest of which all were born in post-depression era Brooklyn, New York in a small apartment. Pop-Pop Martin was an electrician in the Brooklyn Borough Local Union. Mom-Mom Martin was a phone operator, one of those ladies who would have to connect any phone call you made by plugging holes with wires. Ask your grandparents, they'll understand. A blue-collar family, to say the least, where money was stretched thin to begin with, all while having to wrestle seven daughters and their own plans. One of the daughters also had Down syndrome, and her medical bills took a decent toll on the family as well. That being said, a story always rang true about Pop Pop Martin. He was always frugal with his money, growing up in the Roaring Twenties and being one of the millions who lived in extreme poverty during the Great Depression along with having three daughters prior to the Second Great War. Not a penny was put out of place when it came to him. He would, however, make sure that whenever any of his daughters went on a date, whether they be in high school or long graduated college, he'd make sure to give them a dime or two, the toll for the use of a payphone in the city at that time, just in case they needed a ride home. He would always say, I won't ask questions, I won't complain about the drive. Just tell me what corner you're on and I'll be there in 10 minutes. He would say this with his voice ragged and coarse with years of cigar smoke. Since he passed, every time there was a family gathering and the lights just so happened to flicker, my nanny or one of her sisters would pipe up with, look, dad came to the party too, or something like that. And nanny would always tell me that she would look where she walked as if she stumbled across a dime she knew her dad was nearby, watching her. It made her feel safe in the times that she felt unsure of herself or needed guidance in any way. Nanny passed around Easter of 2018. The cause of her death was written as pneumonia, but I knew more. I obtained my CNA in high school and was the only one of my cousins with any medical experience when Nanny fell, breaking her hip right before Christmas in 2016. After a stay in a care facility for about a month, Nanny was sent home and I was put in charge by the family to help her heal. A familiar face to help her with recovery, along with a hospital-issued home nurse as well. Oh, how she would swear at the home nurse, telling her that she didn't need the help. Being a nurse herself for over 40 years and then a teacher for 15 after, Nanny always seemed to have a disdain for hospitals and other people taking care of her. That is, except for me. When I asked for her to do something that she had to do for healing, she would happily oblige. And unfortunately for my college GPA, I stayed with Nanny taking care of her and listening to her stories. Day after day, I helped her with her physical therapy, made her food as she could not move freely around the kitchen as she used to. And that actually helped me realize that I had a love for cooking. My favorite thing was just sitting on the couch across from her lazy boy, listening to the stories of 80 plus years of life, happily ignoring the fact that more often than not, her stories would repeat themselves. We would talk for hours about her life and what she experienced, all while briefly talking about her treatment. She was getting better, so I didn't harp on it too frequently. She was 82 and was all there mentally, and she was a fighter. That was until I noticed the days she forgot to take her medicine began to outweigh the days that she remembered, until finally she stopped taking her meds altogether. She knew that I knew. I filled her medicine box in front of her every Friday, 
But I didn't ask any questions. She was ready, and I knew that, and she knew that. She wasn't forgetting to take her meds. She was refusing. After 82 years of life, countless adventures, marriage to my pop-pop for 61 years, five beautiful children, over 20 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren, she was ready to go. Once back in the hospital, Nanny deteriorated faster and faster and passed the moment that she was alone. Pop-Pop taking a phone call in the hallway and none of her sisters in the state anymore, going back to their respective corner of the country that they made their families in. I was working at a diner at the time, training a slew of new hires how to properly close the kitchen when I got the call from my mother about what had happened. The diner was only a mile from the hospital, but my father somehow beat me there. My father, Nanny's fourth of fifth, was the first person to get there, besides my pop-pop and one of my cousins, who had been down from Boston to give his final goodbyes, who was driven to the hospital by pop-pop, so he couldn't leave with the old man. I followed my father in by a few minutes, giving him the biggest hug I ever have, before seeing the recently passed grandmother over her shoulder. She was so skinny. Thankfully, her eyes were closed. Her cheeks were sunken in and her skin was taut. Seeing someone who has recently passed is something I will never wish on my worst enemy, as I lost so much sleep not being able to get that image out of my head. I stood over the hospital bed saying my last goodbyes before the funeral that would follow the next week when I noticed an odd sparkle on the bedsheets, something catching the fluorescent hospital lights. Sitting next to Nanny's limp, fragile arm was one singular dime. Since then, my father has decided that every spare dime he gets from change he would collect and put in a jar. His were always grabbed from change he got from his cigarettes and coffee from the gas station before work. I always found my dimes in more interesting ways. More commonly, it would be in the parking lot of work where the shine would catch my eye, leading me to pick it up and add it to the collection when I returned home that night. Every so often, one would appear in a place where it really shouldn't, and there would be no way that someone could have accidentally dropped it there. I moved out of my parents' house in August of 2019. The apartment was cleaned thoroughly before I moved in, and sat empty for a few weeks. As I made my first steps into the apartment kitchen, setting a box down on the kitchen counter, everything sat cleanly and neatly. All except for the singular dime sitting directly in the center of the granite, as if it had been placed there intentionally. The small glass jar in my parents' house has been replaced with a five-gallon water jug the type that would sit on top of the office water fountain. Not another coin or dollar fills the jug, only dimes. When asking my father about it a few days ago, he disclosed that he has put a dime in the jug since it switched over from a jar. And to my knowledge, I'm the only one who still adds to the collection. Let me start out by saying that I have a security camera on my porch. The other night, my two kids, who are both teens, came and woke me up at about 3 a.m., totally freaked out. They said that somebody was knocking at the front door. It was a light knock, but definitely a knocking on the front door. They both heard it. I immediately checked the security camera and the movement alerts, but nothing. I got out of bed and looked all around the windows and the house. I checked the back door, looked outside, and found nothing. I tried to blame it on the wind, but the kids rightly pointed out that there was none. I told them I didn't have a good explanation. Last night, I'm startled out of sleep by a knocking on the front door. I grab my phone and immediately check the camera. Nothing there. I get up and run to look out the windows, and it's clear. At that point, I looked at the clock. It was 3.02 in the morning. What in the world is going on? Has anyone ever had something like this happen?
This experience really wigged out my family and I. It was during the time that my mother, father, brother, myself, and our dog, Goose, were all living under the same roof. It was an evening after dinner. Mom was already soaking the dishes. Dad was clearing the table. I was finishing up my plate. And my brother was in the farthest part of the kitchen playing tug with Goose and her new toy. The rest of us turned to my brother to engage in the game, while Goose frantically jumped around between us, anticipating her next turn. We were all joking and laughing, when we noticed right away that something was off. This wholesome family moment quickly took on an entirely different mood. The reflection from the overhead light in the glass door was distorted behind my brother. The glass was warping right before our eyes. It looked as if someone was on the other side, pushing in on the door. You could immediately feel the fear sweep across the room. And before my brother could even process what we were looking at, there was a loud and aggressive bang as the glass snapped back to its original state. We all jumped, and my brother nearly pissed himself as he whipped around to investigate what the hell had just happened behind him. The rest of us just stood there, frozen, even Goose. We exchanged looks with each other as if to say, you just saw that too, right? The room was very still and ominous, until my mother says aloud, well, that was weird. Then she proceeded to go about tending to the dishes, which encouraged my dad and brother to proceed with their normalties as well. That left me standing there in awe, just staring at the blackness on the other side of the glass door. I hate glass doors at night. When I was a child, I used to see ghosts in our old apartment in Manila. Mostly, they were just blurry figures of a person that's just passing by. But one night, while I was watching late night TV, I saw a man standing on our stairs. The man was wearing all black and I could clearly see his face. I could even see that he was skinheaded, like bald. He didn't look menacing, he was just looking. I was so scared I nearly peed my pants. I told my mom about it, but she wouldn't believe me. My dad at that time was a delivery driver, so I barely saw him. We moved to another town after a few years. Decades later, while we're reminiscing about our life in Manila, I told my family how I used to see ghosts in our old apartment. My dad was shook and told us he used to see them too. He asked me why I didn't say anything. I said that I told my mom, but she wouldn't believe me, so I stopped talking about it. Without any prompting from me, my dad said, Yeah, I used to see a black figure of a man on our stairs whenever I came home from work. My younger brother piped up and said that he also saw the same figure in our house. Then I told him that I could see him, and I clearly described how he looked. He thought originally that he'd just been too tired from work, but then he told us the rest of the history of that apartment and who he thinks the ghost is. He told us he had to do some kind of ritual to cleanse it. A few years before we moved into that apartment, there was a tenant who committed suicide by hanging himself on that staircase. He was a nursing student studying for his licensure examination. He rented that apartment alone so he could focus, but due to the pressure from his father, who was a military man and would beat him, he decided to end his life. Ironically, I am now working as a nurse and my brother is in the military. We didn't know his story until this very year. So three years ago, my wife and I moved into a house it was built in the 80s, but it was in great shape and it didn't cost much, so we were excited for such a great deal. We bought it and started renovation on it, which lasted about a year. We moved in and for the first month or so, it was great. 
Well, one night while my wife was at work, I was laying in bed when I heard a little pitter-patter. It was coming from the attic and the door was locked directly over my bed. I panicked. Being a believer in ghosts and stuff like that, I ran to the living room and slept there. The next morning I told my wife, who brushed it off as raccoons or something. She bought some traps and put them up there before going to bed. There were no pitter-patters that night, and in the morning there were no animals in the traps. She reset them and we left for the day. We got back late and went to bed. The next morning she found a squirrel in one of the traps. Problem solved. She let it out and we both forgot about it. Well, two months ago it started up again. Every night this time. It sounds like something small running back and forth across the floor. Every time it happens, I wake my wife, who's a very deep sleeper, but it always stops the second she wakes up. She's never heard them, and she thinks that I'm crazy or that it's just animals again. We've set more traps, but we haven't found anything. My sister recently adopted a little girl, and when she runs, it sounds exactly like the noises that I'm hearing from the attic. I'm convinced that there's a little girl's ghost up in the attic. I've told my wife this, and she told me that it's nothing and to just forget it. But I can't. I heard it last night, and I know I'll hear it tonight as well. When I was 12, I woke up and opened my eyes to see a man standing on the edge of my bed, looking down at me. If you've ever seen the movie Insidious, he looked exactly like the person from The Further, or one of them. He had very short hair, almost balding, and was in tattered, out-of-date clothing that matched the era the others were wearing in The Further from the movie. He was stone still, with a grimacing smile, staring down at me. His head was cocked to the side. From my memory, he appeared all gray, body, clothing, everything. I was terrified and blinked a few times. I was absolutely frozen. He dissolved away slowly. I grew up in a house that my stepfather built on land that has no historical significance or ties to any horrific happenings. I've never seen him again. Does anyone have any insight on what this encounter might have been? I don't even know how to explain this, except for that it has to be something paranormal. I'm super freaked out. Last night, at exactly 3.38 a.m., I woke up with the quietest scream I've ever produced. I didn't even think I was capable of screaming so quietly. As soon as I opened my eyes, I saw this almost ball of black static floating over my husband. And as soon as he woke up from me screaming, it dissipated. He asked me what was wrong, and I couldn't even get the words out. All I muttered was, flies, because it sounded like a huge swarm above him. He rolled over and went back to sleep. When I woke up this morning, I remembered what I saw, and it definitely wasn't flies. I usually have very lucid dreams, and I'm able to identify pretty well what's a dream and what's reality. I'm also really good at remembering my dreams, but last night, I don't remember anything except this ball of black static floating over my husband. It really freaks me out. I've never seen or heard of anything like this. If anyone has an explanation or can tell me what this entity was, I would really appreciate it. I don't feel anything sinister in my home, but this was just too scary. Edit. My husband woke up this morning feeling refreshed. He's been sleeping pretty poorly all week, but he doesn't remember anything about last night. He vaguely remembers me gasping, as he put it, but nothing visual. Final edit. I feel like I should add that my husband has been sleeping badly all week, 
from what we assume is withdrawal effects from nicotine. Also, a lot of people saying what I saw could be the salt and pepper pattern on the TV on the ceiling are wrong. It was that salt and pepper static, but this was very clearly a three-dimensional round ball or orb shape, about two to three feet in diameter. I couldn't see the ceiling through it. Again, if anyone knows what this is, let me know. So I would like to share something that happened to me when I was about 9 or 10 years old. I'm 26 now. So to set the context, I was back in England living with my family in an old Victorian house with my sisters and mom. Just us girls. I loved the house. I never felt spooked or whatever in it at all. One night I was in bed ready to sleep. And all of a sudden, my bed cover went perfectly neat and flat like no bumps, creases, anything. And then loads of symbols started to appear, fast. I can recall vaguely what they were, but it's really hard to explain. When I try to rethink it though, I get all uncomfortable and kind of feel sick if I concentrate on what I saw too much. Then it all stopped suddenly, and I felt a weight at my feet, as if somebody was sitting down on my bed with me. So, I was petrified, not moving, like as if I were stuck, not able to shout. I then found myself surrounded by a bright light, and I had all these people leaning over me. The way I explain it is, you know when you're getting ready for an operation, and you're in the operating room and everyone is just waiting for you to fall asleep to actually start the surgery, and they're all just looking down at you? Exactly that. Well, this was too much for me. I leaped out of my bed and jumped down the stairs four by four, ran from the house screaming that they were going to get me, but my mom grabbed me before I got to the road and I can't remember what happened after that. I was talking about this with her yesterday and she told me that this actually went on for two to three nights before I stopped. I know that as a read it doesn't sound very scary, but it was a horrible experience. Has anyone ever experienced something like this? Ever since I was little, I would randomly hear this chiming sound. It's like three notes, A flat, C, and D flat played in that order and like a pedal was pressed. It's like a wind bell, a bottle being blown, or something similar. And it's a fairly high sound. I think it's a bit more long and has more notes. I'm not even sure if those are the notes I keep hearing, but it's just to give you an idea of what they sound like together. It happens randomly. There can be a few days to years in between, and it doesn't matter where I am, whether I have any electronics near or on, who I'm with, what the weather's like, anything. I would consider it being some kind of brain fart or even an auditory hallucination if it wasn't for my current boyfriend, my parents, and even some of my friends hearing it too. For all I know, it only happens when they're with me. It's been gnawing away at me since I can't ever seem to pinpoint where it comes from or why it happens. Has anyone here heard of something similar? two younger sisters. I wanted to share a story that we all share that is still brought up in my family today and regarded with fear. When we were kids, I had my own room. My two little sisters had to share theirs, and one night we thought it would be fun to trade rooms. I was around 11, and they were 8 and 7. We'll call them Kate, the 8-year-old, and Alice, the 7-year-old. We set up our blankets and pillows in each other's beds. Kate slept on the floor next to Alice on my bed. I fell asleep alone in their room and all was well. But the next morning something seemed wrong. 
My sisters looked terrified and said that they never wanted to trade rooms again. I asked them why not. Apparently they had stayed up very late, chatting and giggling with each other, probably joking about something silly knowing them, when Kate had suddenly gone silent. Alice turned over in the bed and saw what she described as a very tiny man with a head like a sideways football. She said that it was standing in the doorway looking back at them. It just stared for a few moments and they were too scared to respond. Finally, it took some steps toward them and Kate freaked out. Alice said that Kate threw her pillow at it and it ran away. It's hard to get more details from them because as we grew older, Kate became estranged from the family and Alice remembers it but is too afraid to talk about it. It still makes me shake because they both saw it and their reactions were not at all typical of their behavior. I have to wonder, why was it coming to my room? My daughter is five years old and has told my wife and I consistently about a thing she sees early in the morning. She mentions that it's always laying on the floor. It looks like either my wife or I with long hair wrapped in a bun, really long legs and feet. It just lays there looking at her and whispering. She says that it'll just say, psst, and not do anything else. She says that she's too scared to call for us so she tells us in the morning. I have no idea what she's describing. Chances of this just being an active imagination of a child are probably high, but it's still really disturbing. I slept in her room last night with no issue. I set up a baby monitor in the room and told her to yell if she sees it again. I'm going to sleep in her room more often for the next while, just to see what happens. I wish I knew what this was. We had a lot of paranormal activity in this old farmhouse that we lived in. Little things would happen. We would hear voices or something would turn on and we would just ignore it. Until one night. My husband and I were watching Stranger Things. Ironically, in the show, it was just after the lights had flicked out. Ours started to do the same thing. I made a small joke and thought nothing of it. As I went into the kitchen, I watched our vase go into the air maybe an inch and fall. Again, I thought it was creepy, but I didn't think a whole lot of it. My husband did end up getting an EVP, but unfortunately we lost it once we moved out of there. Anyway, we heard a pig on the EVP and keys. We also heard a female saying, Abby. We had a lot of other things happen in that house too. I'm not sure if it's just a ghost or if it's a demon. So far, every house I've lived in seems to have paranormal activity. My brother seems to have a lot of paranormal activity too, but he won't share what exactly has happened to him. I used to try to get recordings in his place, but he told me to stop and to stop messing with it. So out of respect, I did. I think whatever this thing is, is attached to my brother. I think that because he recently stayed with us for the weekend and I had my first paranormal experience in this new house. I had one of the doors slam with force, not because of air drafts or anything like that. And the stove kicked on. All of this happened right after he left. I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if something is following him around, but I'm pretty sure that something is attached to him. That or we picked something up from the farm, but honestly, I really don't know what's going on.
So my grandpa has this ranch about 25 miles east of Pace in Arizona. For those in Arizona, it's between Heigler Creek and the 260. It's very secluded, but the land is good for grazing. I spend a lot of time running Jersey cattle on the range. Every night, one of us rides out to check on the cattle in the field and to check the fence line for holes in the wire. A few days ago, I was riding out to check on the herd at about 1.30 in the morning, and I kept hearing this rustling in the tree line, running along the fence perimeter. I figured it was just coyotes or squirrels. I see a lot of them up there. It went away every 10 or 15 minutes, and then I heard it again. The second time I heard it, I was off my horse and walking him to a little water trough. The cows were about 150 to 200 yards away, just within my view, given the moonlight. I heard the rustling again, but this time it was heavy. My horse Vegas and I both looked up at the same time, wondering what in the hell we were hearing. At this point, I came to the eerie realization that whatever was out there was tracking Vegas and I, and it didn't seem so interested in the cows. In an attempt to scare it off, I got back on my horse and grabbed my whip and uncoiled it. Don't worry, I don't use it on animals. I only use it to make a loud noise to move the cattle along. I cracked it a few times, figured that was safer than using my pistol. The rustling stopped and the forest was dead quiet once more. Not thinking much about it, I went back to count the head. I marked 38 heads, all the cows were there. So I started my way back to the house. I was about three and a half miles away and it's a bit of a trail ride to get back. It was about 10 minutes of silence until I heard that rustling again. At this point, I was getting pissed. I figured it was some dumb little coyote thinking that we were going to lead him somewhere. So I called my grandpa on my radio. There's zero service out there like none whatsoever, so radios are our only communication. I told him I was going to fire my gun so that he didn't get worried when he heard it. I reached down and pulled my revolver from my side and I fired one round into the air. The rustling stopped as the shot rang out through the woods and mountains. My ears rang and the smell of gunpowder filled my nose as the smoke settled. After I calmed Vegas down, I started riding back, only for the rustling to return five minutes later. I started getting really nervous at this point because usually coyotes run away when they get scared by a loud noise and they don't usually return that quickly. I didn't have a flashlight on me because I'm dumb and forgot. So I used the lame iPhone flashlight and dismounted. I slowly walked to the tree line where I had heard the rustling since I had my gun out, ready for an animal to jump at me or something. I flashed my light around through the clearing in the trees. To my right, I heard rustling about a hundred feet away. I looked over and to my surprise and confusion, I saw a black silhouette of a horse running across the trail. I immediately thought, oh crap. Is that one of our horses? Is that someone else's horse? So I got back on my horse and rode over to where I had seen it, shaking with anxiety. I looked around and was confused. I had no idea how that horse had even run into or out of the forest because it was so thick with shrubbery. And when I looked back behind me to start riding back, I stopped frozen in fear and got the chills. I dropped my gun and heard the sound of it hitting the ground because in front of me, about 50 feet away, was the silhouette of a man wearing a flat brimmed hat who appeared to have chaps on. I picked up my gun and aimed at the figure and it was gone. I got back on Vegas and rode like the wind to get out of there, constantly looking behind me in fear of it following. I made it back and told my grandpa. He tried to calm me down. And that's when he told me that he had had some weird experiences too.
I grew up in a farmhouse that was built in the early 1800s. I lived there with my brother and my parents until I was about 10. I was young, so some of my experiences seem very foggy, but I'm going to share my experiences and the families as best I can. A little backstory on the house. Multiple people had been killed there. A lady was shot behind our garage and someone fell down our steps and snapped their neck. That's basically all I know about the house. It was located in the middle of nowhere, with woods behind it, and a very old house and a garage that was visible. Our farmhouse was two stories, with a dirt basement that had walls that were still made out of lead. One time, our brother woke up late at night. His room was on the second story, facing our backyard. Outside his window was the roof of our porch, and for some reason, he opened his curtains. He spotted a lady waving her arms back and forth over and over on the roof of the porch. He was young, so you can pretty much expect his reaction. My sister, who didn't live with us but often slept over, fell asleep on our couch in the living room one night. She woke up late into the night. Our living room was connected to our dining room and saw by the computer, which was right next to the couch, the apparition of a little girl who was staring at her. She didn't give many details, but she said that she ran up the stairs to my room and hid on top of my bunk bed. My mom had more encounters than anybody. My mom is a very spiritual individual. She feels very connected to the spiritual realm. When we began moving out of the farmhouse, she believes the spirits became angry with her and our family. She woke up one morning and she switched her position to face the doorway to her room. She saw a dark figure staring straight at her. She claimed this felt as if it had gone on for minutes. Out of nowhere, the figure leaped in one swift motion straight to her and suddenly disappeared. The thing about my childhood home is that I never felt alone. I don't know if this was a good thing or a bad thing, but something was there. I've been debating with myself for months whether or not I should tell this story. And today, I finally feel like it's time. I need to tell people about this and I need someone that knows about this to hear it. I lived in a farm around four years ago. From the moment we moved there, I could tell something was wrong. I felt uneasy in there, as if there was something constantly spying on me. A little detail about the place and situation. We didn't technically own the place. It was borrowed from a woman that was trying to sell it. Call it a demo. So we didn't have access to the house, and we slept in a wooden storage house. The farm itself was like this. There was a barbed wire gate that you manually had to move in the entrance, and in front of it there was an open, empty field with one of those outside washrooms to the right. Passing by it, there was a small group of trees, and then the place where we slept. Passing that was the actual house, to the left and then the forest. In the forest entrance, there was a tree with a ripped plastic bag tied to its branches, meaning the bag was tied while it was still small. People used to do that here to mark something. And right in front of it, there was a mound. Someone buried something there. I moved there with four dogs, plus there was the dog that already lived there that we took care of. Our routine was to wake up at 5 a.m. and to go into the city so I could go to school and my parents could go to work. The first night we stayed there, I noticed my room was the only one in the entire house that didn't have a lock. I couldn't sleep because of the weird feeling I had. I stayed up all night and slept on my way to school. Then things got weirder. The door started opening at night I dismissed it as the wind, 
cliché, I know, but it became more frequent and more violent. Then, still in the very first week, I saw it. It was a black humanoid figure with a white face. It was like the white face had empty eye sockets and instead of a mouth, just had an empty cavity on its face. It stood on my door entrance, staring at me. I decided I would not sleep while I lived there. I couldn't bring myself to move or do anything. So I just kept staring at it, trying to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Some nights later, it became impossible to pretend because it started moving and doing things. It entered my room. It tapped on the window. It was a metal window that was right beside my bed. It started to slightly move things and kept being a general creep. Whenever I flashed a light on it, it disappeared, but the eerie feeling stayed there. I started keeping a flashlight in my room and playing music to keep myself awake and calm. Eventually, of course, I started falling asleep during the day, and on some days I woke up with headaches and the feeling that my eyes had been pushed into my skull. I woke up with pain. Eventually, my parents got security cameras, because while we were in the city, some people entered the place to go fishing. There was a shortcut to the neighboring farm's lake through the forest. This is important because of what happened next. Then one day my aunt went to visit. She had some weird superstitions and said that the place had gold buried on it for some reason. She went to the forest and saw the mound under the marked tree I talked about before, and she decided it was a good idea to unbury it. And so we did. Bad idea. There's a certain feeling of digging dirt that differs from rocks or mud or clay. I learned that this day as I dug the hole. Then, after going through a small layer of fragmented rocks, I hit something soft and resistant that felt like leather. I hit it harder and pushed through it. Immediately after it, there was something hard with a complex and detailed shape. I tried to break through it, since my aunt insisted it was protection for the gold, and my parents were just whipping me into helping her, but it was no use and it occupied most of the area of the hole so we couldn't dig around it. It was like the hole was made specifically to bury it. My aunt said then that we should cover the hole. She didn't cover it and went home. That night was hell. There was no tapping on the window. There was a strong banging. The thing kept entering my room nonstop and even the flashlight stopped working. I had to stay awake, feeling everything just pressuring me, pressing in on all sides. My door wouldn't close. That thing would make noise and it would just be there, staring at me. All the security cameras stopped working the moment that it all started. There were four cameras, one pointing to the front of the house, one pointing to the washroom, one on the back that showed my window and one that pointed to the forest. That morning, I went to check the camera footage and all the cameras had stopped working, except for the one pointing to the forest. There was only static for all the other three, but that one just had a small blur. After that night, it never appeared again. I still couldn't sleep out of the fear, but it never actually showed up again and things got calmer. We moved out some time after that. I keep thinking about it even now, four years later. It was just too real. And there were things that were noticed by other people too. I especially keep thinking about that thing we hit while digging and how that night was the worst. I keep asking myself if maybe we found a body or something haunted that was hidden for a good reason.
This is my mom's story about me when I was just two years old. My mom was sleeping with me in her bed when I woke her up. I was laughing, pointing up at the ceiling and smiling as I looked around our empty dark bedroom. I kept saying, look mommy, look, and laughing. Seeing nothing, my mom asks me what I'm pointing at. I tell her that there are beautiful fairies of many different bright colors flying around the room. But here's where it gets creepy. I point to the dark hallway and say something like, the bad ones are in the hall. That's when my mom freaked out, ran to a light switch and turned on the light. I immediately stopped laughing and pointing around the room. I guess the light made them disappear. Keep in mind that I was only a toddler and I have no recollection of this, but it's one of the stories about me that my mom tells every once in a while and I think it still freaks her out. It was Christmas Eve, 2019. I had gotten into a drunken argument and I had to spend 24 hours, Christmas Day, in an empty, silent cell. I was hungover at the time and had been beaten by police for exercising in my cell. Well, after staring at the blank walls for so long, in my state of utter misery, I saw fairies. I don't believe in fairies or anything else paranormal, and yet there they were, flying around my cell. Little female figures with dragonfly wings. They never spoke, as far as I can remember. They just flew around the room and I played with them. They were semi-transparent, colorfully dressed, and I could not touch them. They were about the length of a hand, around 10 inches roughly. They had come to keep me company and keep me sane, I decided. I saw them only for a minute or so, and then they were gone. After this, I decided that they had merely been figments of a traumatized and understimulated mind, as jail cells are designed to be unpleasant, and the mind can create things in those lonely situations. I never saw them again, until this morning, exactly two years later. I awoke this Christmas morning to the exact same fairies flying around my room. I saw one clearly. She smiled and flew around me, and I remembered her like an old friend. My mother entered my room, and in a haze, I told her that the fairies had come to visit again. She assumed that I was dreaming, but I was very much awake. Where I live in southwest England, fairies are something that many people believe in, and have done for centuries. After the first event, I recently visited a nearby haunted jail, and I learned that one old woman escaped her cell with no plausible explanation. For the rest of her days, she swore up and down that the fairies had helped her. But to me, they are nothing more than fiction, something I never even think about. I suppose it could be some sort of trauma, as every Christmas Eve since then, I've had nightmares of running from the police like I did that night. I like to consider more rational explanations, but then I'm starting to think that I do believe in fairies and I hope they will visit me again, maybe next Christmas. I saw a fairy portal once and I almost went through it. I was nine years old and it was the week before school. I was depressed about classes starting because kids had started to bully me. My mom took me on a day trip to the local preserve. When we arrived there, there was a bus load of elementary school kids and my heart sank. I was noticeably chubby and kids were always cruel about it. This was the 1980s and fat phobia was intense. So we walk along the main path full of kids. My mom could instantly charm children, so they loved her. But when she wasn't looking, the kids would say mean things to me. So I wandered off the main trail and I found this Indian trail. 
It was very distinct in spite of a lot of undergrowth. It passed between two trees that arched toward one another, almost like a doorway. And then I came to this huge hedge. It was too high for me to see over, and it stretched all the way from the Indian Trail to the main path, seeming to cut across the forest. The Indian Trail led right up to it, and there was a fissure, just wide enough for a child to fit through. I peeked inside, and it was so lusciously green and cool, and this was a stifling hot day, Nebraska heat, humid and oppressive. It was unusual to find some place that cool in the forest, given all the heat and humidity. I squeezed into the fissure, set my foot on the earth on the other side, and it was soft and moist and springy, unlike the hard, baked, sandy earth of the main forest. What I saw remains the most beautiful place I have ever seen. The sky was pearl blue. There was a vivid green bank sloping down to a dry creek overgrown with ferns. A huge fallen tree trunk spanned the ancient creek like a bridge. On the other side was a forest of silvery trees, the most inviting thing I've ever seen. Peaceful, wondrous. All the sounds from outside were hushed. No gabbling children, no nothing, just peace. It filled me with joy and at that time of my life, I had precious little that made me happy. Now, I had braced my hand on the outer wall of the hedge, and my other foot firmly planted in the hard, sandy, real part of the path, because somehow I knew that if I put both feet on the ferry side, I could never go back. It was so hard not to walk into it and start exploring. I truly felt the place call to me, and I have never wanted anything so badly than to cross that tree bridge and explore the silvery forest. Even the air felt different, moist and sweet. I felt a light gentle mist touch my face as I closed my eyes and breathed in deeply. But then I thought of my mom. Could I really just leave her behind? She had had a sad life too, and I thought it would be a gift to show her this place and we could go in together. Well, as I had that thought, the fissure in the hedge began to close, pressing against my stomach and back. I was forced to choose, go forward or go back. I pulled myself back out of it with an effort. The hedge branches caught my t-shirt and tore a hole. Branches scraped my arm, drawing blood. I went back down the Indian trail, past the two trees entwined like a doorway, and found my mother on the main path, still talking with those brats who'd had the nerve to bully me when she wasn't looking. I insisted that she come with me to see this most glorious thing. She didn't doubt me and was willing to follow me, only now it was really difficult to find the Indian trail in the undergrowth. It was all overgrown and covered in leaves, but I spotted it and I made it as far as the two trees that were like a door. Only now they were strung with nasty cobwebs like the trees were suddenly so old and ugly I couldn't imagine going near them, and the trail had disappeared entirely. I looked up and pointed in the direction of the hedge, sure that she could spot it from there. It was nine feet high and stretched for several yards in both directions. But no, there was nothing, only the usual trees and undergrowth. I was so shocked when it wasn't there, I saw then that it was impossible that it had ever been there. It would have been bisected by the main path, which was packed with children and teachers. I was speechless, trying to get my mother to understand what I had seen. She didn't doubt me, and she said, maybe it was just for you to see. I felt such a profound feeling of loss, like really inconsolable loss. Probably at the end of all my days, I will still think of that place. That was my chance to enter the fairy realm, but I turned back. I've never shared that story. I thought that if I ever had children, I would tell them about it, but that hasn't happened, so I thought I'd share it here.
This happened back on the 27th of December in 2019. I live in the UK, but I'm primarily of Irish heritage on my father's side, and my family has been living in the locale for roughly four generations. There's a hill that I had to walk up after work to get to my home from the station. At the top, there are two Victorian lampposts. On the right, a couple of houses alongside the steep embankment, which is a dell with a tarmac understory, and to the left, woodlands, mostly oak and beech. Anyway, at the lamppost closest to me, I could see a figure struggling to climb it. At first, I thought it was a rat. I'm pretty short-sighted, and I wasn't wearing glasses. As I got farther and farther up the hill, it started to look more and more humanoid. I'm in shock at this point, and a bunch of correlations come into my head, and they all rest on fairy. I start laughing hysterically because of it due to the sheer absurdity, and I literally shouted something rude at the fairy because I was just in total disbelief. I guess I thought taunting it would prove it or disprove it, I don't know. But two seconds later, this clap-bang explosion goes off at the back of my head and knocks me to the ground. I just start running to get out of there. I had no bumps or injuries on the back of my head, and the sheer force of it is just unexplainable. I honestly would have shrugged off the entire experience if it hadn't been for that. Moral of the story, I suppose, is don't be mean to fairies. I'm still not entirely sure what I saw. I'm from Virginia, and I currently live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. My entire life I have experienced the paranormal. From dealing with ghosts and shadow people at a security job, to dealing with an inhuman being at a retail job, I have seen it all. But lately, I am experiencing something new. Being from the mountains, I have been aware of Hanes and Bogans and, of course, the Fey folk. Thankfully, I've never had to deal with the latter, until now. As of late, I have started hearing small sing-song voices crying out, seen flashes of silver, and have noticed small knick-knacks and collectibles disappearing and reappearing. I keep a broom at the front and back door, I circle my house with salt, and I use oil on every door frame, and I have a cross or a religious symbol in every room. I have a Judeo-Christian upbringing. Of interest, we literally live right next to a giant sinkhole that my neighbor has heard growling from before. I'm not really looking for advice for getting rid of anything or helping deal with it, since it's not really an issue and we don't necessarily feel threatened. I just thought it might be fun to share my experiences and see if anybody else also has experience with the Fae. When I was around four years old, I went to my grandparents' house for my very first solo sleepover. I remember playing in their guest room and always having my attention drawn to a specific corner of the room. Anyway, that evening I went to bed soundly. I woke up right around dawn, and I can remember as clear as day seeing a small humanoid figure walking across the windowsill of the window facing east. I remember the dawn light creating a sort of silhouetted image of this thing, but I could tell that it was wearing clothing. And from the waist down, it had a sort of transparent look to it. As it neared the end of the windowsill, I can remember it noticing me watching it, and it quickly hopped off the sill into the dark corner of the room that had always seemed to draw my attention. A few years ago, I was visiting my mom and I brought it up. She said that she vividly remembers picking me up that morning, and I was scared out of my wits, to the point where I would refuse to ever enter the same room again to gather my toys. I've run this encounter through my head more times than I can count, trying my best to dismiss it as a childhood dream. 
But 30 years later, that memory sticks out in my mind as clear as day. I'm pretty sure I saw some kind of fey creature. I just don't know what. I'm an 18 year old guy. I started having sightings, which I strongly believe are due to the Fae. And then I started researching. I recently learned about them and read stories, and I've seen many things that seem to add up to them. I don't know if they are attracted to me or if I can somehow see through the thing they hide behind for a while. The way this works is that usually I see them for a couple of seconds and then they're gone. I don't suffer from any kind of mental condition, and I've never hallucinated. The creatures are not something that I could make up. I'm not that creative. There are some creatures that I've seen many times. I live in an area that is surrounded by forest, and on an autumn day, I was hiking in the woods behind my backyard. On a hill, I saw a little creature wearing a dark cloak with collars that seemed to be made of fallen leaves and its head seemed like the skull of a bird. I don't think it showed itself intentionally because it started running and then it was gone. The reason this memory freaks me out is that it was a windless day. And for the few seconds that I saw this, the leaves were moving as it ran away. I saw this creature a second time. At least I think it was the same thing. Out of curiosity, I hiked there again the next day. But this time, it was really huge, and I felt like it was warning me about its territory or something. So I turned back and I went home, and I avoided the area if possible. My second one, which is pretty common, is to see these little people who seem to be like a mix between a human and some kind of rodent. They always walk into my house. They never seem hostile, maybe a little grumpy. I believe that they might be brownies or some other type of house spirit. These are the ones that I would like to talk about and learn more about because I see them so often. I don't know. What do you guys think about it? I'm still not entirely sure what I'm witnessing. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to pick up some drinks. As we each threw out suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple of swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 p.m. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then began heading toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat and a red coat on him. That sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. Sort of looked like a doorway I didn't think twice to stick around and I tried to play it cool as if nothing happened and returned to my group. I never mentioned it to anyone, but can confirm, I think there are gnomes in San Francisco. This happened when I was 13 or 14. This was probably one of the last times that I went consistently to see my aunt. She lived very close to a mountain near Oaxaca. Her husband, my uncle, was a pretty wealthy guy. He sold and bred livestock. He had a lot of horses, cattle, goats, and dogs. Their house was a pretty big place with lots of land for the animals. Of course, their house was very isolated, 
The closest town was quite a ways away. We went there one year to stay with her, and everything was normal for the first few days. When the weird things started happening, it was early in the morning. I wear wristwatches, and I always take mine off to go to bed and put it back on after I brush my teeth and whatnot. I remember waking up, grabbing my watch, and putting it on the top shelf of this shelf outside the bathroom, brushing my teeth, and coming back to find it gone. I thought for a second, and I looked around the shelf and under it, but I couldn't find it. I went back to the room I was staying in and looked around there, and it wasn't there either. I thought maybe one of my siblings was playing with me, and I looked around, but all three of my siblings were fast asleep on the floor. That's when I started getting, not scared, but worried. I go to look around the shelf once more, and I still can't find it. I remember saying out loud, whoever took my watch, give it back, because I'm getting mad. I walk away to put my shoes on, and from the living room, I could hear a slight noise. It was my alarm on my watch going off. I peeked my head into the hallway, and I could see the blue light from my watch. That's when I got scared. I walked up to it and put it on, and got a really uneasy feeling. I go to watch TV, and I see my aunt walking into the kitchen. I say good morning, and I ask her if she grabbed my watch. She says no, but not to leave valuables in the open. I asked her why, and she says, the duendes will take them and hide them. I gave an uncomfortable laugh and said, right. She obviously saw that I thought she was crazy. She told me she was serious and that the duende probably grabbed my watch. In my mind, I'm thinking, this lady is nuts. Later on that day, I asked my mom if duendes were real. She gave me a concerned look and asked me why. I told her that my aunt said that there were duendes in the house. She steered away from the question and just said, if you feel scared, just start to pray. I didn't think about it much after that. I remember that we watched a movie in the living room and I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up to a thud coming from the kitchen and footsteps running from the kitchen. The footsteps were light, but still audible, kind of like when a cat runs. I see lights turn on from the hallway and I see my aunt running toward the kitchen. I hear her say, Mendingos duendes which means roughly damn elves. I slowly get up and peek into the kitchen and it's a huge mess. A lot of stuff knocked over, most of it food. I asked if an animal got in, maybe a raccoon. She's so irritated by the mess, she just says, Duendes. I roll my eyes and look at my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to help her clean up. We finished cleaning up in about 20 minutes, and that's when I helped her with the dustpan. It was one of the sucky ones where you have to crouch over and hold it. When I crouch over, I look to the huge pile of food, and I can see either sugar or flour. And that's when I made out little tiny footprints. Not like baby footprints, but smaller, like if a lizard had human feet. I look to my aunt, and she says, I know, I saw them, I told you. I'm still not completely convinced, so I go to bed and I wake up and nothing happens for a few days. The last experience I had with these things was when I was sleeping and woke up for some reason, or rather no reason at all. I remember feeling uneasy, trying to figure out why I was awake. I could hear those footsteps again as something small was running in front of the bed. I sit up fast, and I see a small shadow, running weird, like it was kind of waddling but still moving really fast. All this happened in a matter of seconds. I turn on the lights, and nothing is there. I couldn't make the shadow out, but it was small, maybe a foot tall. That's when I started believing in them. I was so uneasy after that, and I was glad I was getting out of there. I may have been a skeptic going into it, but after that visit, 
I'm a believer in duendes. For reference, I live in Sweden, and my family is very anti-religious. The house we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day, he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need room that is very clean, too, to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can only fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment when making the jars of honey. My dad had to put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll, about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he goes outside for about 10 seconds to get some air. I can see him the entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time, I was watching and I took out my phone. When he comes back in, we proceed to start again, but out of nowhere, he asks me where I put the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk, but it's not there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start looking all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was tiny, which is why it's so odd for something to disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it's still freaking me out. Usually when my family and I experience something paranormal, we just blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained. There is seriously nowhere for that thing to have disappeared to, and that's why it's freaking me out. Even in the unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or just heard it. Moral of the story is, gnomes might still exist in Sweden. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life, we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel, and only occasionally. One place the dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the pines that was impossible to find if you didn't know the way. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades up until the 90s and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in bars who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out. And there were a few stories about people who displeased him suddenly disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy and his farm and hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forestry to camp, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated. But the vibe was always the same. That straight-up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to visit. There would be 44-gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but Dad didn't seem concerned. On a trip when I was a teenager, it got strange real quick. My friends and I were all piled into my Dad's 4x4, and we were driving through the bush to Spikes, so Dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us all out. We drove onto the property, and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spike's hut, there was what appeared to be a cowboy, 
slumped against a log, hat over his face, taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural, uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd be sat if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of a workday, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of on the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out of the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back through, we would stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up, as he just drove through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, never having moved an inch, still in that same unnatural position. I yelled out to my dad to stop, reminding him of his promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me, locked the truck doors, and drove off the farm much faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt back roads. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, but we knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile at best and dangerous at worst. Dad denied that any of the events of that day ever happened after that, but my friends and I were still curious as heck about what was going on out there. So, a few months later, we went camping on our own and set out to find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property, but eventually we found it without Dad's help. Something was off once we got there, more so than usual. My mates jumped out of the car but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut was to get out, but I'd spent two hours finding the place, and I was going to explore it. One of my friends acted brave and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants with knowing nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but we were on high alert. It felt like somebody could be back at any minute, or that they had never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls. I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ashes from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged to the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I figure that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby's sock, tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt, then a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a women's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off. I rounded up my mates to get out of there. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. And there's no way that anything good had come from having children's clothes right by a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, but he just shook it off, saying that weird stuff happens out there all the time. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes, but I can tell you that I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father ever again. This is a very long story, but it's worth telling and I hope I can find some answers. I live in the state of Georgia, in a rural town not too far from a major city. 
There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides two neighborhoods. It's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. show up seemingly without warning. I should mention that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there impossible. One night, I was taking our dog out. He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. For some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out. Very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Not thinking about it, we pushed onward. After he tinkled, we walked back. This is when I noticed it, or rather heard it, the crunching of leaves. At first I thought it was one of the dozen cats on our property, until I realized that it was matching my steps. If I walked, it would walk. If I stopped, it stopped. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is, and that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something, and then I saw some creature of some kind. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. My dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash. He ran in the door, whining. I was quickly behind him. Once we were inside, I bolted the door, and I ran to tell my girlfriend what had happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it was probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door. As we walked toward the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away. As we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing, but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer, and closer until it was maybe 20 feet away, but still nothing. No eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house. I decided to check with the neighbors to see if maybe one of their many dogs had gotten out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbor, who we'll call Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for, but he was curious, so he came to investigate. This is when I noticed that whatever this thing was had followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind his house. Gun in hand, we went into the backyard scanning for something. We could hear it rustling, or maybe running, about a hundred yards away in the thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. And then, it stopped. It was dead silent. Scanning and on edge, we hear and see nothing. And then, bam. All of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, scared shitless, shot randomly at, well, nothing. We never saw it. We never heard it get close to us. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick too thick to run in, so what teleported silently in front of us and slammed into the gate? Spooked, we were about to run, but then we heard it. It was human in nature, but not English. A language sounded alien-like, but not a known language, that's for sure. Dave, a hunter for the last 40 years, still to this day cannot explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, we bolted. He covered me and I ran to the house. Not ten minutes later, we both hear a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power. I ran outside to see what it was and, of course, nothing. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac and they all agreed that the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called, and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched. The responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. They took the report and left. To this day, we're still not sure what that encounter was. 
Also, Dave doesn't go outside at night anymore. That's how bad it spooked him. The next night, earlier in the day, my mother-in-law and a police officer for a town 40 minutes away installed two motion-activated trail cams along the wood's edge. They were brand new. Keep that in mind. Thinking maybe we would see something, we waited for nightfall. Later that evening, I went outside to feed our outdoor cats. That's when I heard it again, rustling. This time, not taking any chances, I ran inside and told everyone what I heard. They all piled by the back door and urged me to go out there and look. Reluctantly, I agreed. I took my flashlight and walked to the edge of the woods. Knowing that there was a trail cam covering this area, I figured if it got me, it would be on camera and my sacrifice wouldn't be for nothing. As I got to the wood's edge, I could still hear it rustling. I'm shaking at this point because I could tell it was maybe less than 15 yards in front of me. Everyone at the door was just watching me and could hear this thing. And then it was quiet. For a moment, it was gone. Or so I thought. Just as I'm scanning with my flashlight, trying desperately to see a normal woodland creature so I can laugh this whole thing off, boom, something fell out of a tree and hit the ground so hard that it shook the soil beneath my feet. It was so close that I was sure it was going to lunge out of the brush and snag me. I dropped my flashlight and ran the hundred yards back to the house in what felt like two seconds. I just kept screaming, get in the house, get the F in the house as everyone was already scampering inside. They had heard and felt the thud too. Our neighbor Dave called my mother-in-law to ask what that loud crash was. For him to have heard it from well over 700 yards away is insane to me. Once the adrenaline died down, we realized that this happened right next to the trail cam. Problem solved, right? We got the evidence of this thing. The next morning, we checked the SD cards on the trail cam. Both of the cams had videos up until 11.47 p.m. The rest is corrupted. They were brand new trail cameras and brand new SD cards. We reset everything and set them back up. And to this day, we've still never encountered the creature again or caught anything on camera. My wife and I have been having a lot of paranormal activity. After moving into a wooded area just outside of Pittsburgh, everything started. Our house is isolated from the neighborhood. That only makes the fear of something terrible happening even worse. I would like to point out that my wife and I are logical, rational thinkers who are educated to some degree. Since we can't explain these events and we fear ruining people's perception of our family, We've turned to all of you. All of these experiences have happened while sober and within the past two years. There's a lot, so please give us a chance and let us know what you might think it is. Incident one. First things first, animals dying in the wild is common, duh. But hearing the screams of struggle and pain, almost as if the animal is being tortured, I don't know if that's normal but the sound sends chills down my back. This incident happens frequently. Incident two. When we're walking in the woods, accompanied by my wife and kids, I stumble upon a small clearing in the trees. Under the leaves were children's shoes, shoes that were worn out as if they'd been there for a very long time. Incident three. This one is hard to believe, and trust me, I know. I was in denial and didn't tell my wife what I had seen for weeks because it just sounded so fake, and I didn't want to catch any flack for seeing whatever it was. Smoking a cigarette out of the second floor bathroom window last fall, while scrolling on my phone, I had that feeling as if someone is staring at you. I glanced away from my phone to look. I caught in my peripheral vision a humanoid type being. I use peripheral because before I could really focus on it to see it, it bolted into the woods behind my house on the east side. 
I was completely caught off guard and terrified. I didn't even watch it run into the woods. I looked straight ahead and acted like I'd never seen it, like a deer in headlights. I acted like scared prey. This creature was not human, and that's why I was so deeply terrified. It was tall and had shoulders and a head, no hair, and a color of skin that I couldn't really make out, but it just wasn't normal, you know? It's weird because my brain didn't know what to do. I couldn't process it fast enough. I just stared completely ahead and stayed straight, completely frozen from fear. Hearing the strides this thing had was unexplainable, and the speed that it had, rilling through with such ease in the middle of the night in the woods, is beyond human. I don't know what it was. Months go by. I was in the same bathroom window where my wife and I tend to smoke when we don't want to go outside at night. We opened the window to smoke, but it sounded like it was pouring rain. Both of us were completely confused because no water was falling from the sky at all. I walked downstairs to go outside to try to understand what was happening. The garden hose was on and the handle was pushed into the dirt, shooting water into the trees above, making a surprisingly loud raining sound. We have no idea how that happened. Incident number five. This is another ongoing incident. Basically, we always feel watched at night. In the daytime, the woods are normal and somewhat peaceful. But at night, it's totally different. You have that constant eerie feeling that you're being watched. Incident six. At this moment, we've become interested and are sitting by our window every night trying to find explanations as to what humanoid thing that was. We were in mid-conversation on a random subject when a loud crack came from the ground right below us. The noise was loud enough and close enough to make both of us jump. We were super scared and locked the window and decided to stop for the night. It sounded like a bat or an axe, maybe, hitting a tree really, really hard. From the humanoid creature to this loud sound, we've become so afraid that we actually have our children sleep in our room. Incident number seven. As we were laying in our bed, my wife woke me up at 2 a.m., freaking out, saying that she smelled burning plastic and thought that something was on fire. We have a two-story house and had our bedroom window cracked. We looked outside where we thought the smell was coming from. That's when we saw a lit up triangular shaped thing in the back of the house, deep into our woods. It was orange lights and blue lights and orbs next to it. You could see shadows of people walking around this thing. We immediately thought of a cult. We were so scared we were about to call the cops, but doubt set in when we double checked the window. So we never ended up telling anybody. Incident number eight. After all of this, we still have to stay active, so we went on a walk one evening with the children around the neighborhood. Noticing that the sun was setting, we headed home. Obviously, this place is weird, so who would want to be outside in the dark? We got to our gravel driveway, which is about a hundred yards, tall trees on one side and bushes and smaller trees on the other. As we're walking about 15 feet onto the driveway, we notice bats flying down left to right and right to left. We'd only ever seen up to this point maybe a couple in our yard, feeding off the bugs, I guess. I started to walk down the driveway. My wife stayed behind, opposing this idea. The farther down I got, the scarier it became. I had completely underestimated the amount of bats. I started running because my children became frightened. As I start running, Bats, and I'm not kidding, began to line their flight path with my head. They would turn away probably five feet from my face, maybe closer. This was completely terrifying. As I'm trying to avoid these demons, I hear my wife screaming as she flies past me and beats me home. My daughter, on the verge of tears, was saying that she was so scared she thought she was going to pee her pants. Now, before everybody loses their mind, I know that bats are docile and pose absolutely no threat to humans despite rabies. These bats were not acting like normal docile bats, which is why this was so weird. I cannot explain why or how it happened, 
but it was as though something went off in their brains that just said, attack, or at least make us really afraid. They came in a line at us and then veered off right at the last. I've certainly never heard of that happening and I know that's not normal. So we didn't treat them like docile bats because they weren't acting like docile bats. Incident number nine. I didn't personally see this, but it was weird and doesn't add up, so I'll include it. One Sunday, my parents were over for dinner. When I came back down to talk to my wife, I said, yo, my mom said she saw some chubby girl with a black sundress come out of the woods, walk in the tree line, and then go further down. This lady came out of the north side of the house, like east to northeast. I know it's hard to picture if you don't know what the property looks like, but that's what happened. The odd part of this is that the northern tree line of the property is pretty rough terrain. Steep hills, torn bushes, loose soil. It would be hard to hike it, let alone in a sundress. Although about a mile and a half north through the woods, you do pop out right outside of a small town. So I suppose it could be rational, but it still seemed really odd with everything happening. Most people wouldn't go hiking through that kind of terrain dressed like she was. The last incident, so far anyway, is that if either one of us goes to smoke at night at the window in our bathroom, we always hear this kind of bell. It kind of sounds like a cymbal. Being skeptical, we thought it was wind chimes. We've looked though, and there are no wind chimes at my neighbor's house. It's the only neighbor we have for about 200 feet in between each other on our south side. The bells are coming from the southeast side of the property, and this is something else that we cannot explain. We're pretty scared, and as you can tell, it's pretty unbelievable what's going on. We don't really know what to do. All these weird things just keep happening, and we're afraid that it could escalate or take a turn for the worse. It's already overwhelming so overwhelming that it's the only thing we've been able to talk about for a long time now. Anyway, if any of you have any idea what could be going on, let us know. This is a story that my mother and aunts told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now, and it has never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old-fashioned. He was bitter, abusive, and a complete macho man. My mother was raised never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking or having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He was also not religious at all and found things like faith or hope stupid. This story takes place sometime in the 70s, most likely early to mid-70s. My mom was born in 65 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts, as well, remember this happening, but nobody knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother and my grandmother were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwoods road and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out of the car and messing around, as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. 
John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they're all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff that they had brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried under it. This mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child-sized. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There were nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted to something dark. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic, and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous, sunny day, and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was clear immediately what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with a rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she first saw it. Something was wrong. Very, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman that she is, soothed her children and told them that it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart that they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least, no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they really began to panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep inside the woods. It sounded as though there was a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of a drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause, and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out as a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited, fear-ridden, as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate within them. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out to them from the trees. Go, he yelled. Get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at that moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was in fact the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. My grandmother began throwing everything back in the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things as quickly as possible and threw it all into the car. 
They had no care for the things that they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk. Items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather has refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children, or even my grandmother. Every time this was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them never to ask again. He never went to the police or told someone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself that I would ask him one day. Now I can't, and I regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of the state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with him, outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. This story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all of the abuse he caused, I separated myself from him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I am one of the only people in my family who is still curious about what happened. I've always been interested in mysteries, horror, and conspiracy theories. This story piqued my interest more than any others in my family. This isn't the only strange story from my family, but it is definitely the strangest. I wish I had answers, but... I hope you all find the story as fascinating as I do. This happened when I was growing up, around 2004 or 2005, when I was about 13 years old. It took place in rural Texas. The town itself was really small back then and not much to look at. It's just one of those towns that really isn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease that was about a thousand acres, I think, down outside of that area and was complaining about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land. Being open season on hogs in the South, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us some quality father and son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in my dad's hardtop Jeep Wrangler. The car was so uncomfortable. I hated it. All I had to do was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish in my youth. The drive, obviously, took most of the day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year and that the cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty. I didn't really care. At this point in my life, I had been in scouts for a couple of years and I spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was pretty comfortable roughing it. So, after unlocking the gate and driving to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough, dust and dirt everywhere, flies. I remember that it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin and crapped on the floor. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out and then setting up the cots, we decided to sleep. Something about that night was weird. I was never able to get comfortable enough to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't put my finger on why, but I had that feeling of being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was an hour, maybe. When we woke up, it was early, about 7 a.m. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs and find a good place to set up a blind. It was the summer and horribly hot in the afternoons, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to an area of trees, lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs. Typical torn up ground where they'd been rooting, so we followed them into the trees. 
I was looking for more signs when my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up and seeing someone standing about 50 yards away. Some of their body was blocked by trees. This was private land, so they definitely weren't supposed to be there. We also had confirmation from the owner before we got to the lease that nobody was there, not to mention the gate was locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some bright colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out something like, Hey, we're, we're hunters. This is private land. The person didn't move at all, dead still. We were about 30 yards away and could see that he was turned away from us with his hands in his pockets. Weird thing was that the person was in a ski jacket and what looked to be ski pants. Now this is Texas in the summer. It was about 98 outside by then. My dad called out again, no reaction. He told me to stay behind him and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holder. That's all we had at the time since we were only scouting the area. The rifles were back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side and then my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him, asking if he was okay. He finally passed around to the front of the man, and my dad stood straight up with a really confused look on his face. I called out and said, what's wrong? He called back saying, it's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring, and as I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes it was wearing were brand new. No dust, sap, bird droppings, or signs of being outside for more than a day at the most. At that moment, I looked at my dad and I could see him get worried. Almost immediately after, I felt that feeling again, like we were being watched, and I knew that my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly like I was so scared. My dad whispered, we're leaving right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was terrified, so it felt like an eternity, but in reality, it was probably only about 45 minutes max. After returning, we packed up and beat feet. We drove back home that day and didn't talk much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was confused. He said that he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said that he had never had an issue with people on his property because it was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there that we didn't know about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. After we got back home, we talked and my dad wasn't able to sleep the night before as well. He had the same feeling, but didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was sleeping. Turns out that next week he got a call from his buddy and he checked the whole property and never found a trace of anyone, including the mannequin. One day, I went to my friend Nicole's house with my friend Crystal. While I was there, Nicole tells me this story and asks what I think it is. For anonymity, I'll change out some names, and for context, Nicole, Nicole's boyfriend John, and Crystal all work together. I hope this isn't too confusing, but I'm curious as to what you think. Nicole parked her car at work one day and saw John and Crystal having a smoke together. John was facing Nicole, and Crystal was facing John with her back to Nicole. Nicole went upstairs to her desk and everyone was asking where Crystal was. She said she was downstairs, having a smoke with John. John comes up and goes to his desk. She asks him where Crystal was, and he said he didn't know. She asked him who he was standing with, and he said no one. 
Nicole then gets a text from Crystal saying she was going to be late and could she tell their boss. Nicole starts freaking out because she knows she saw Crystal downstairs. She described her in detail, hair up in a top knot, white long sleeved shirt, black leggings and black sandals, with her purse hanging from her right elbow. To be clear, Crystal was just married and John is not her type, so that can be eliminated as a possibility of lying and cheating. I asked Crystal what she was doing while Nicole saw her with John, and she said she was sleeping at home. She also said that she lost those black sandals on vacation a few months back. My mind goes to a few places. Number one, how stressed are you? Your mind can play tricks if you're not feeling well. Two, astral projection, since Crystal was sleeping. Three, residual energy, since this is something that happens frequently. Four, Crystal's mother? Crystal is the spitting image of her mom. Her mom passed many years ago. John's dad went into the hospital the evening I was there, and the event happened a few days prior. Or, a doppelganger wearing the missing shoes. Now something else super freaky happened that night when I was at her place. The night she told me this story. I was getting ready to read Nicole's tarot cards, and I went to the bathroom to wash my hands. When I came back, Nicole had my cards out already and was shuffling. Anyone who is familiar with tarot knows that you do not touch the cards until they're handed to you, and she had never done this before. I did leave them out for that crazy moon about a month ago, and they've gotten a lot stronger from it, so their pull to touch them is overwhelming. But still, she knows better. I had previously explained the rules to her of how I read tarot for everyone's safety, so I have no idea what possessed her to do that. I sat and took them back and began to shuffle, but the energy was off, like really off. Her dog was chill all night, but the second I began to lay her cards, after giving them back for her to shuffle, he began to bark at the sliding door that led to her balcony. We're talking over 10 stories here, so no one is there. No birds, no other animals, nothing. I started to become unsettled since the off feeling was getting stronger. We tried to shush him and settle him, but nothing was working. I decided to put the cards away since there was something amiss going on. From what I saw of her reading, it was a very good one but there was something else stopping me from reading her. I urged her to smudge the house and everyone in it, and once that was done, I felt better. The next day, I am so freaking sick. Coughing, sore throat, nauseous, weak body. I can't eat, I can't sleep, I can't drink anything. This lasted for two days and I'm on the mend now, but still not 100%. So, what in the world did she see? What was going on? Does anyone have any idea? I am at a total loss. I'm definitely not going to touch my cards until I'm 100% well again and do a cleansing on them. I will eventually ask the question, but I wonder if you may have some input as to what happened that night and what Crystal saw before. So, my girlfriend has been experiencing issues with a dark entity for about seven years, since she moved out of an old house a number of years back. This entity started showing up in the house, in a room where she said she felt very ill just being near it. This entity looks exactly like her, to the point that when she cuts her hair, it has her new hair. She's shrouded in all black and it seems that she has facial features, but you can't make them out. She only seems to show up when my girlfriend is doing bad mentally and seems to feed off of the negative emotions. She has been described to somewhat sound like my girlfriend, even to other people who have seen her. Along with her, there have been other spirits documented by other members of the house 
with a local ghost crew coming over every once in a while. The hot spot is the closet in her mom's upstairs bedroom, where they're most sighted. Any thoughts on what type of spirit this could be? Other than filling people with a feeling of dread, this entity hasn't harmed anyone, but any help would be appreciated. I barely remember this story, but my brother, who is four years older than me, remembers it vividly. My dad was on dialysis and went through eight-hour cycles. One night, my brother and I are in the computer room playing games at like 2 a.m. Suddenly, from around the corner, my dad appears. He starts being mischievous and trying to scare us. My dad was never a jokester. Plus, he was supposed to be on his dialysis machine. My brother was so unnerved, he said, Dad, what are you doing off your machine? My dad replied, Oh, it's fine. The facial expressions and manner of speaking prompted my brother right then and there to ask, Are you a ghost? To which my dad replied, laughing, No, of course not then started heading up the dark stairs. My brother watched as my dad climbed the stairs and decided to follow him. When he reached the bedroom door that my dad turned into, he saw my real father was in there fast asleep and was already hooked up to his dialysis machine, which was running properly. Not only was my father never one to kid around, he was also very sick at this time with kidney failure and cancer. To scare us in the computer room, he would have had to go out of his way to literally come from the dark shadows of the dining room, which meant going down the stairs and looping around. My brother knew something was up right away, and he won't ever forget this story. My boyfriend of two years and I go to the same college. We both take night classes and live in an apartment complex across the street from campus. Neither of us are paranormal enthusiasts, no Ouija boards, etc., and we're also agnostic. So class is from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. We walk over together, but usually I walk back on my own unless I run into him coming back from the lecture building. This time, I was walking alone. It's about a 10 minute walk to the apartment. I could see the light was on as I approached the building, and I thought he had gotten home first. I thought that was a little strange, since I hadn't seen him walking in front of me, but I figured his class had let out early. For some reason, I stopped to look in the window before I went in. I could see what looked like him sitting on the couch, but something was weird. He was sitting very stiffly, with his shoulders kind of lifted, and staring out the window. He, or it, must have seen me, because he gave me a very hateful scowl, got up, and walked to the back room, down the hallway, and out of sight. When he stood up, he kind of swayed, like he was drunk. This was bad, because my boyfriend is two years sober, also, he has never scowled at me like that, for no reason. I went inside, calling out to him, but I got no response. I went to the back room, and nobody was there. I searched that whole apartment, which didn't take long because there's only two bedrooms, and only so many places a grown man could hide. The only way that this thing could have gotten out other than the door would be to take the screen out of one of the back windows and climb out. But we had to replace one of the screens last year, and it was difficult to remove and put back in. You needed to remove four screws. It was an old building. It would have only had seconds to do this entire process. My boyfriend got back at around 10.30, and I told him what happened. He's a lot closer to an atheist than I am, 
and managed to convince me in the moment that it wasn't real. But I'm not so sure, really. Nothing else has been weird since, and this happened a week ago. But it keeps bothering me. For some background, early in my childhood, we moved around a few times, but it was in the same general area, so I never had to change schools. The first seven to eight years was in a home my dad built himself. He was a builder, and the area was very bad. Mosquitoes were everywhere. The terrain outside was great. There was a creek and forest area for me to play in. It was huge and eventually we decided to move out. We rented a place a few minutes away, but we kept working on that house, patching it up for selling it, and eventually we moved into another place. My dad stayed in that house for a bit to work on it some more, so my brother made the decision of living with my mom or my dad. He chose to live with my dad, and I stayed with my mom. My brother would occasionally come over, but I had to sleep in my mom's room when that happened because we shared the same room, but never slept in it together. On the night of this encounter, I was sleeping in my room alone. I rolled over in the bed and saw that across the room, there was a figure. I was horrified. I remembered that my brother wasn't there. The bed was made, and again, we never slept there together. The sheets were scrunched and lifted, like a figure was under them. I silently got up and went to my mom's room, and she was reluctant, but she let me sleep with her. When we went to check, the sheets were made and nobody was there. It took some bit of time to tell her the story, enough time that someone could have made the bed and run, I guess. I'm not sure if it was some deranged weirdo, or a mimic, or a copy, or what, but I'm so glad I noticed it, because if it was the first one, I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't rolled over. This was a long time ago, when I was in the third or fourth grade. I used to live in a slightly haunted house in a small town. While I lived there, I would sometimes get the feeling that someone was following me around town or in the house. Sometimes I would also feel a couple of light taps on my shoulder, like someone was trying to get my attention. Other times, I would hear someone call my name from behind me. Every time I turned around to see who it was, there would be no one there. I could never see whatever was following me but sometimes other people did. The first time it was my sister. She had finished washing the first load of dishes and was looking for me so that I could dry them and put them away. I was upstairs and I heard her yell my name. I yelled back and came downstairs. When I got there, she was staring at me like I had grown a second head. She told me that she came into the living room and saw me laying on the couch watching TV. She asked me if I was going to come in and finish the load of dishes. I didn't respond and kept staring at the TV. She yelled my name to get my attention. That's when she heard me yell back from upstairs. She looked up the stairs, then back to the couch, to find that I had disappeared. Things like that happened a few more times around town with a few of my friends. They would see me somewhere they would say hi, and they would get no response. Then I would show up shortly after, and the other me would vanish. I never got to see what it was that followed me before we moved. It never followed me out of town, or maybe it did and I never noticed, because the next house we moved into was haunted as heck. Either way, I thought it was an interesting experience.
My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house, and we're waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub, and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. And also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story? About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning but both of us, being immature, decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. Well, I left a little late, and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner, so I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just going to go get my script and a few things that I was going to get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier? I just walked past you, like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil, dirty look, so I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating and what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night, when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me, and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil, and that's exactly what this look was. Just evil. Like, even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still, at the time, we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened.
The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen, facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room. Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him, but his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron, a regular who we see almost every day, walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons. The other doors are either emergency exits, which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. 
I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget, though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me, so menacingly. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room, at that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast, but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time, so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired. She was scared that it was a thief though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station but as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified as it just stood there looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger he seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, he explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again. I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often likes sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. 
we don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom, and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching, like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features, so we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply, so we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot so it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle wearing the same clothing but what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways and everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different, but to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, 
So I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore. So I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car. No dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, yoo-hoo. And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard. So I stepped back and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel, was my mom's friend, staring at me, wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. This happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced or who or what I had seen. So I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it.
When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments. So I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such. But many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside when there was no one there and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted, and so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears, over time, through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so I deliberately ignored it as much as possible and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body, but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home, and I walked in still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. So a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me, and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. 
It stayed black, as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up, confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb, like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in. The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had heard him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So I have no idea what happened. Just three days ago, my friend and I went up to Walmart. There's this pavement trail up by my neighborhood basketball court and all of a sudden, three people practically materialized in front of us. We thought nothing of it at first as the trail is commonly taken. However, upon closer inspection, the people looked just like our three friends, down to the exact details. Normally, I would have no problem with this, however, one of the friends had gone to Georgia and the other one was at their house. Around this point we got creeped out, but oh well, might as well keep going. We get about halfway up the trail and one of our friend's voices calls out. The voice was the exact cadence and tone. This is when things got weirder. My friend and I both turned to each other and asked if that was really our friend. From there we braced ourselves for some kind of silly jump scare turned the corner of the trail and they were gone. We kept going and saw them again, this time in a home goods parking lot along the way there. We were able to get a good look at them as we were far enough away to not be detected, but close enough to get details. I saw one of them, our younger friend of the group, was standing at an angle. I checked his face for identifiable features, but there was no face. I mean like there were no features whatsoever on his face. It terrified me. The others turned around a little bit at the same angle as they were preparing to get to the next part of the trail that led directly to Walmart. Their faces were all contorted. I mean like physically impossible kind of contorted. Then I realized they were following a particular pathway that we followed about a month ago. I mean down to foot placement, people placement, everything. It was like watching my past. They rounded the corner and we followed not far behind. They were gone. Entirely gone. I mean no trace, nothing, like they didn't even exist. I brought this up with one of the friends that we supposedly encountered and she freaked out. She was more freaked out by the fact that them taking the trail meant that they were nearby. It's sort of become a taboo topic, but I think they've followed me home. Just today I was taking out the garbage and down through this alleyway there was a voice speaking to me. It was that same friend's voice, 
but just ever so noticeably slightly distorted. I turned and there were three figures, shrouded in shadow. Their outlines were the same as those very friends I had encountered. Needless to say, I finished taking out the trash at lightning speed. I don't really see this as anything extreme right now. I'm more so just looking for closure on what happened. I don't need anything immediately at this moment, but if anyone has an answer, and I know someone must, please let me know. Recently, my friend and I were recalling unexplained and possibly paranormal experiences that we've had in the past. I remembered this one that I had pushed out of my mind, honestly for good reason. Both of us are believers in the paranormal, but we also try to find a scientific and logical answer of what we've experienced before we jump to a paranormal explanation. However, neither of us were able to reach a logical conclusion on what I'm about to describe. Firstly, a bit of backstory. The house I grew up in was in a neighborhood almost completely surrounded by forest and greenery. While that sounds like it would be tranquil, it was not. Myself and other friends of mine have felt very uneasy walking through those woods, even in the daytime. And not just the usual, I feel like someone's following me feeling that you sometimes do get in forests or other areas like that. It felt like someone was watching you from the second you stepped into the woods. My house was on a street extremely close to the forest. It was about a two minute walk from my house to the main trail. Off the main trail, you were immediately met by thick forest. There were a few small clearings before the huge open field behind the forest itself. So it would take a long time to fight your way through the large forest before getting there. Very few people would make the trek out there, so I could always almost guarantee that every time I went out there I would be able to enjoy the nature in serene isolation. In the warmer months of the year, I liked to spend my free time walking through the forest, especially in fall when the leaves had all turned orange and red, just before they would start to fall from the trees. This story takes place on one of those fall days. I had been walking through the forest listening to music with my earbuds in for at least a couple of hours. The last time I had run into anyone else was about an hour prior, as per usual, for my walks. Even though I knew that I was probably very alone apart from wildlife, I remember still not being able to shake the feeling that someone was very close to me. The sun was also setting, so any sane person would be heading home by now anyways. After walking for a while longer, I decided to eventually start heading back in the direction of the main trail. By this time, the sun was barely still out, and it was getting dark pretty fast. I had almost made it to a pretty nice clearing, but there was no way in hell that I was going to go there only to have to walk home in the dark in the forest, especially since I was already very unsettled. As I turned around to head back toward home, I heard a voice, muffled by the music playing in my earbuds, come from behind me. I had been in very deep thought for a few minutes, so I was a bit startled, but assumed that I had accidentally spoken out loud to myself. Before I could even take a couple steps further, I heard someone speak again. Fully aware of my surroundings now, I froze dead in my tracks, my heart pounding as I took my right earbud out and sharply turned around to see who was behind me. I was horrified to see a person standing with their back toward me, looking off into the distance. Everything about them was so familiar, and it took me a couple of seconds to come to the horrifying realization that I was staring into the back of myself. It was wearing my dark navy and white plaid jacket, the black hood of the very hoodie that I was wearing resting on the collar of my jacket. Even my same short, blonde, unkempt hair with its brassy undertones shining in the last bit of light left from the setting sun. And then it spoke again, in my voice. It's not too far ahead now. My exact voice, cadence, tone, everything. It took me a second to snap out of the paralyzing fear I was in and book it home. 
I didn't try to speak to whatever it was. I just ran as fast as I could to the main trail and out of the forest. As I ran, I could have sworn that I heard someone chasing me the whole way out of the forest, which might have just been a product of being hyper-aware of my surroundings and my state of fear, but I didn't dare look behind me, because I was terrified of what I might have seen if I did. After nearly tripping and falling on branches and stumps a million times, I tore out of the forest and onto the road adjacent to my street. I kept running until I was on the complete opposite side of the road from the edge of the forest. I turned around and the only thing I saw were the bushes and branches I'd pushed through on my way out, springing back into their natural place. I stood there staring at the forest for a minute before heading home, in fear that whatever it was would pop out, but I saw nothing. I didn't go back into the woods for some time after that, and almost every returning visit I brought a friend with me. My friend told me she has also had odd experiences in those woods, and so has her sister. They have both seen tall, dark figures standing in the woods when they took walks together. One of them would see the figure, say nothing about it to the other one, and then book it out of the forest together. I had seen similar figures, but I had just always written it off as seeing shadows from bigger trees, my mind playing tricks on me, things like that. I had blocked this out of my memory for a long time, until my friend had brought up her strange experiences in the forest, and how she constantly felt uneasy in it. Still to this day, years later, I cannot come up with a rational or scientific explanation for what I saw, and I've had little luck looking online for answers too. Either way, it was by far the craziest thing I've ever experienced. I think my son has a double. The first time this happened was when he was three. My older sister was staying in my apartment and watching TV in her room when my son walked in. She asked him if he wanted to watch cartoons and put some on for him. He just sat quietly at the end of her bed while she tried to get his attention. Then she hears him laugh in the other room with me. When she looks to the bedroom door, the copy of my son disappeared. When she told me this, I honestly assumed that she was high and just imagined it. The second time, a friend was visiting from the UK. They got up at night to use the restroom and saw my son's door was wide open, lights on, and he was sitting at his little table with a friend. He told me about this in the morning and thought it was kind of weird since it had been three o'clock in the morning. My son wasn't in his room that night, and no other children were present. I rationalized it as him being tired and imagining it. The third time was when my son was around eight. My best friend and roommate, new apartment, different state, got up to go to the bathroom. The hall light was off and it was dark, but she saw my son standing in the hall next to her. She told him to go back to bed and step into the bathroom. She then sees him in the mirror, standing behind her. She says, stop it, go to bed. My son then turns and walks away. That's when she realized something was wrong and looked back into the hall, but he wasn't there. She goes to his room and he was still asleep. She ran to my room to tell me. And for the first time I thought, okay, there seems to be a pattern here. Maybe there is something going on. The last time was when my son was 15, and this time, I saw it. I was in bed, depressed, and tired after having had a miscarriage. I woke up to my son curled up in bed next to me. I thought he was trying to comfort me, which was sweet. I sang a lullaby to him and pet his hair, before it clicked. My son was 15 now. This was him at age 7 or 8. I froze and asked who he was. He just said, everything's going to be okay, and then got up and left. Everyone just assumed that it was blood loss that made me hallucinate. But I was not hallucinating. I was wide awake, and I didn't have any other experiences like that. No one has seen my son's double in five years, but I still think it is super weird.
So when I was seven to nine, I don't remember what age I was exactly. I had this doll that was about as tall as a German Shepherd dog. This doll had a voice box where if you pressed it, it would laugh and giggle for about 30 seconds. This voice box was placed in a pocket in the back of the doll's dress. Eventually, I kind of got annoyed with the voice box due to it going off a lot. Before this incident, I had thought that some stuff behind it was pressing on it or that the pocket was sewn on too tightly. So it was pressing the box when there was pressure on the pocket. As I said, I just got really annoyed with this box. So I had emptied out a drawer and placed the box in the drawer. I had closed the drawer carefully so as not to move the box in the slightest. After this, I went to sleep. At maybe midnight, I had woken to the sound of the box coming from the doll. The doll I had made sure to place on the opposite side of the room from the drawer that the box was in. Forgetting for a minute that I had taken the box out of the doll, I tried to go back to sleep. About five minutes later, as I was dozing, I remembered where I had put the box and I got up to open the drawer. It was still there, exactly where I had left it. A few weeks later, I got rid of the doll. However, for a few years after that, I could still hear the laughter of the doll's voice box, even when both the box and the doll were out of the house. To this day, I can't really explain it. I have a hobby of collecting older dolls that kind of sit in my room. Some have been gifted and others I just got for me. One that I got recently just doesn't seem right. Others I can feel the energy from, hence why I got them. But this one, there was just nothing. I got her anyway and named her like I do with all the others. Her name is Abigail. Ever since I brought her home, Things have been really weird, especially when I sleep. I've been having dreams of drowning and a girl screaming. At first I thought it was just stress because of exams, but now it's getting worse and I'm done with school. Now, maybe it's not Abigail, maybe it's another one of the dolls, but this had never happened until she came into my home. The dreams of the girl, she couldn't be older than maybe 15. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything I should do? I don't really know what to do next. I've been interested in the paranormal for as long as I can remember and have been investigating the paranormal for about 12 years now. I purchased three haunted dolls a year ago, and up until now, all has been quiet, except for one incident that happened a few months ago. I was laying in bed, desperate to use the bathroom, but not wanting to brave the cold. Being the only person in the house, I hear someone say, psst, behind me. It takes me a minute to brave turning over, but when I did, there was nothing and nobody there. I have no explanation for this sound. None of my electronics make this noise, nor does anything else in my house. My cats do not have access to my bedroom or the hallway leading to it while I sleep. We can't hear their noises from the bedroom. Then nothing more happened until last week. My partner has a cylindrical massage roller it sits underneath the exercise bike. So we're sitting watching TV and the roller rolls across the room out of nowhere. Nothing interacted with it. I accept that there is a possibility that it could have fallen, but with how it usually sits, it seems very unlikely. It's also never happened before and it hasn't happened since. My cats have one of those little balls that light up when something touches it and the last two days, it's been randomly lighting up on its own. I hear this can happen when the batteries are low, but this was a fresh ball about a week ago. And today, 
sitting quietly, scrolling social media, the guitar that sits on its stand across the lounge from the sofa randomly rings out. All the cats were sleeping at the time, and nothing was around it to fall and hit the strings. Again, I just don't have an explanation for it. I plan to do some EVP work with the dolls and see whether anything comes of it, but my house also sits on the side of an old hospital, and has a church and cemetery just across the street, too. So who knows what might be going on. This is super exciting for me, but I'm remembering to keep my skeptical brain on and trying to debunk everything. Update. There was a little more activity. I was just getting myself ready for bed two days ago, and I heard scratching coming from under the bed. I did the obvious cat check. No cat. I checked for signs of other wildlife outside or something, but nothing. I went for a nap yesterday, and once again was woken to whispering in my ear. This time, it really did sound like my partner speaking words that I couldn't understand. He wasn't in the room. He wasn't even talking elsewhere in the house. Very strange, but still super exciting. Update number two. Things have been quiet for a few days now. It feels kind of eerie with nothing happening. Almost like that feeling you get of the calm before the storm. Update number three. The scratching continues. It's happening in the daytime now too. I've searched high and low for the source and have come up empty. Balls continue to flash on their own, but nothing new yet. I hope to get some quiet time in the next few weeks to try some EVP. Update number four. I was woken up to scratching again yesterday, last night, followed by a woman quietly singing. This is completely new activity. Every other time that I've heard something that sounded like a voice, it was always male. Update number five. Laying in bed last night, trying to sleep but struggling, I heard a male voice grunt behind me, as if somebody was turning over in their sleep in the bed next to me. It took me a moment to realize that my partner was not in bed yet, so this noise couldn't be coming from him. I've never been scared of any of the paranormal activity that I've ever experienced before, not even when I've been physically touched. But for some reason, this felt different, wrong somehow. I jumped out of the bed and literally ran into the lounge, shaking. My partner searched the bedroom in case someone had broken in, but obviously there was no one to be found. This one has left me very shaken, and I can't yet put a finger on why. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free. And they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them, so I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half the bag sorted out, when we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips. My mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed 
and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass, and my mom and I were just taking a break, chatting, when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed, and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me, and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other, and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex, and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them, even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips. As it wasn't new and there was no box, I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Rando Nautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. We happened to find a random clearing in the forest with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier, having large eyes and, for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed, some kind of ritual. We don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. My church had a fish fry in the seventh grade. I had decided not to go, but to host friends after. I was playing video games when they walked into my house. I noticed that one of them had a strange all black doll in their hands. Obviously, I inquired, and they told me that they had found a voodoo doll. Later, I would learn that the creepy kid at school had thrown it at them. None of us bought it, so naturally, we started putting our hair in it. After messing around with it to no avail, we left it on the floor and turned on a movie. Later on, another friend joined us, and not seeing the doll, he kicked it clear across the room. We paid it no mind at first, but seconds later my friend starts to cry 
as blood comes pouring out of his nose. Freaked out, we run out of the basement and try to move on with the night. For the next couple of nights, my friends and I experienced weird events. The main two people who messed with it got the worst. The number one culprit had footsteps walking all around his room, and his door would open during the night. Along with the footsteps and doors, he would hear masculine voices outside of his door. His parents were lesbians, so it wasn't either of them, as they both had fairly feminine and higher-pitched voices. The second culprit was awoken three nights in a row with bloody noses. Personally, I just had very vivid dreams of family members being killed and horrifying images. Not much has happened since, and I don't really talk to those guys anymore as we kind of all went on our separate paths. I still am not entirely sure what we experienced or how it all happened, but I'll never mess with one of those things again. I just got this beautiful antique baby doll from Etsy. Something about her really caught my attention, and I just had to have her. I do collect antique dolls and trinkets, but I knew since day one that this one was different. I have used two different kinds of EMF meters on her throughout the day, and I have received various intelligent responses, both with the EMF and with the spirit box and combined. She doesn't have any batteries of any sort in her that could give off a faulty reading. I have had my phone in a different room with the lights off while conducting multiple tests with the EMF, and I ensured that she wasn't anywhere near walls or light switches. I'm looking for a logical explanation here. If I can't find one, I may just assume that this doll truly does have a paranormal attachment. I've always loved the paranormal, even as a little girl. I grew up with horror movies and find the paranormal fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past that I'll probably tell about later, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience I ever had. I don't have any photos or anything, because this happened when I was in the third grade in 2003 and I didn't have anything to record with, or even to take pictures with at the time. Anyway, I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom, and my grandmother was in the room. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, on my bookshelf where all my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see one of the doll's dresses billowing around her, and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. I should mention that my mom had rearranged them that day and had them all facing in the same direction. Skip to the next day. I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something. And I walked back in and all of my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of there screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again, but my room had always been off, and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later, and this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls, and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was being watched, and that I wasn't alone, but I brushed it off as paranoia, because I never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement. Something changed. I was in my room one night, and I felt something breathe down my neck. It scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night anymore. My parents divorced when I was 15, and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was a medium. 
I asked her if whenever she came over, she would check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped into my room, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because the family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-sized, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that that was the one she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in my room anymore. I still constantly check my bookshelf, though, just to make sure everything's all right. And it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls. But still, I don't think I'll ever forget. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart-opening, for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy, and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object, same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional, though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess, but Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. Something about it saying my name and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye and ushered my boyfriend away from her because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered 
that I am 100% sure is haunted, and maybe even malicious. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood, and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it, physically, was shortly after my grandmother died, and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died, and it's lost as far as I know. I had always written off this phobia as some weird, irrational childhood fear, because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade, and I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me it made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly. I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother, because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger, because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but... I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown and I would take him with me everywhere, in the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it, staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors. 
the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me and I have them on my desk and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they're often very delicate and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill store and she begged for one. I let her buy it since she takes good care of her things. I quickly noticed that something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed that she was very careful about which one she picked. She treats the dolls like gold and keeps them sitting up on the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and I hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger and I'm getting used to it but it's just freaky, and it never happened until we brought that first doll home.
My dad died when I was 11. Every summer, we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I had several dolls myself, but one I loved the most. It resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for about three to four years, and I never touched it once. I just admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and my window were open, but it was quiet outside, no wind, nothing. The doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, about six feet. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket and went to sleep, hoping that I could. I couldn't figure out how it could have fallen from that height and not broken. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, face down. And I started to think, how could it have fallen? It was protected from any wind, even though there was none. And there were 40 centimeters of empty space in front of it. Someone would have had to pull it out and drop it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and I never touched it again. I didn't even look at it. I still don't really know what happened. Sometimes I think that it was my dad, but I only think that to comfort myself. As I grow older, it doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that I got from him? My story happened when I was nine years old. I'm 17 now, and I'm in Belgium. I shared the story with some friends, but I wanted more people to hear it. For my birthday when I was nine, I had tickets to go to Disneyland Paris with my mom. I was really happy because it was my first time there. It was really good, and I had a great time. After I did the Buzz Lightyear attraction, I asked my mom if I could have one of the toys, and she bought me one. I played with it sometimes, and I was the kind of kid that threw his toys around and found that funny. I did that with my Buzz Lightyear, but I was careful so I wouldn't break it. My toys never had a violent impact, it's not like I had an anger problem, I just liked to throw them and see what would happen. I stopped to play with it. But the thing is that one year later, he started to make these really random sounds and shoot his laser at night for no reason. I have glasses, but on my bed, I was able to see the red light and the sound was loud. The thing is that nothing was touching it and he doesn't have any kind of detection thing on him. Nothing was touching him, so it wasn't supposed to make a sound or talk or shoot or anything. Even if I was young, I didn't believe in ghosts, but this still scared me. It was making sounds only at night when I was in bed asleep or trying to. I was really scared because it just never stopped. I remember asking my dad to please get it out of my room. So he put it in the basement. My basement is really small, but the really creepy thing, the really scary thing that happened wasn't that. My house has two floors and it isn't that big. My toilet is super small and it's next to the basement door. When I was younger, I was really scared of the dark and I was holding my cat downstairs to go to the bathroom when I needed to and turn the light on because my cat brought me comfort. The scary thing that happened was it was two or three in the morning and it was really rare that I would ever wake up to go to the bathroom. My mom was often awake, but not that night. 
When I got down and started to walk to go to the bathroom, at the exact moment that I passed the basement door, my Buzz Lightyear doll started shooting and talking. I immediately went to the bathroom and I don't remember how much time I stayed in there. Even when I was in the bathroom, it was doing those noises and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. At some moment, it was almost like the sound was getting closer and coming upstairs. I don't know if I was just hallucinating because I was really scared or if it was real. The problem is that I really don't remember how I got out of there. I really don't. I know that I probably would have just run up the stairs to get out of there as soon as I could, but I don't remember coming out of that bathroom or if the toys stopped talking and shooting, but I do remember how scared I was. It was horrible to know that I was the only one awake, but at least I was okay and nothing dangerous happened to me. But it's still the worst night that I've ever had. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So of course some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then, there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by, so when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asked him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, 
Who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him. My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls. Basically purchasable nightmare fuel. She had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary, so this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular Living Dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it. Okay. So this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. Then something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall it was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. 
We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace, and then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit 
that might be lurking inside. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one-floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage, and I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back, even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and the eyes started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. It wasn't coming from upstairs though, it was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement and I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea but it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights, the only one that had five bedrooms because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house, completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics, trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper and dolls, many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious and I didn't see the room and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. 
As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony handled open L pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. I lived in an apartment in Hawaii where I had a lot of terrible nightmares. The layout of the apartment went like this. You stepped through the door into the foyer and immediately to your right was the kitchen. To your left was a shoe closet. There was a half counter separating the living room and dining room and to the left of the living room past the shoe closet was a T-shaped hall. The shorter hall was at the front and it led to two bedrooms, one at each end and the long hall that split this short hall went past a full-length mirror, washer and dryer, two sinks, and ended in the bathroom. This hallway consistently creeped me out. Noises, movements out of the corner of my eye, and a mounting sense of dread every time I stood in the hallway was already starting to manifest, along with a lot of other instances. In order to avoid being scared from my nightmares, I slowly start to become a night owl. This means sleeping all day and staying up all night. Well, one night I decide to shower for whatever reason at a time between midnight and one in the morning when everyone else in the household is asleep. I start doing my usual routine, starting with washing my hair, when I start to hear a faint noise that wasn't water hitting porcelain. It takes a moment to register what I was hearing a woman screaming, absolute bloody murder. Anger and horror and anguish are obvious in her voice, but it was so faint I couldn't possibly fathom where it was coming from at first. I turned to look out the tiny window in the corner of the shower, the only form of ventilation in our bathroom, and I think that it can't possibly be coming from there. After all, I live on the 22nd floor. So I'm rinsing the shampoo out of my hair, dwelling on this screaming which is still going on, when I finally pinpoint it. It's coming from the drain, between my feet. Okay, I think, 
It's probably a neighbor watching TV, and the noise is just traveling through the pipes. No biggie. I'm fairly convinced of this now, and I'm on that train of thought, wondering who in the world is watching TV while in their bathroom, and wasn't doing that a dangerous thing. As I'm thinking along those lines, as if to retaliate my nonchalant brushing off, the screaming starts to get incrementally louder. Of course, I figure somebody's just slowly turning up their TV. It takes seconds to register that the screaming is turning to faint screaming and gargling. It's not a TV. It's literally in the pipes, and it's coming closer, starting to echo as it comes up the drain. Then this thought hits me. What will be here if and when it finally reaches the end of the drain? Fear suddenly washes over me, the sort of fear that led to me shutting the shower off, soap still half in my hair, falling out of the shower in a panic scramble, and backing away as the screaming continues. I don't bother with clothes or a towel. I leave all the lights on for my parents to scold me about in the morning. I didn't care. I ran through the hallway and into my room and locked the door. After that, I never showered again unless somebody was awake. From then on, that little window in the corner of the shower, I could feel someone staring in through it, constantly watching me. Every now and then, if I glanced up at it out of the corner of my eye, I could see the swish of long black hair disappearing out of sight. I hated that apartment. And in some ways, I still do. So, for slight context, I'm 22. And as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old, and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room 
and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia and I felt extra guilty about the lamb since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. When I was around seven, I got this stuffed animal named Sparky. I slept with Sparky every night and would carry her around everywhere. Anyway, a few years ago, one random day, I just couldn't stand to be around her. Every time I was, I would get super cold and I would get this really bad feeling. So I left her behind my bed for a few months and eventually I forgot about her. Then when I finally got her from behind the bed, she seemed normal again. That was a few years ago. She's beside me right now, and she's normal. I randomly thought a few minutes ago about when she seemed off, so I asked my pendulum if she had a spirit or something attached to her a few years ago, and it said yes. Also, I asked if it was an evil spirit, and the pendulum said yes. I just thought that was interesting, so I wanted to share. Let me start off by saying that my family and I have always thought of this to be a super strange phenomenon. But to this day, I have never been able to understand what the heck happened. When we were younger, our cousin Daniela always talked to us about how these two dolls she had were possessed and plotting to kill her. Well, one of the dolls belongs to her and the other was a porcelain Tinkerbell doll that belonged to her older sister. They shared a room, by the way. We never paid mind to it because she had a wild imagination. Fast forward into months, maybe even a year, into her telling us these stories. One weekend, my older sister and I stayed over at her house. It was four of us upstairs playing in their room and we knew to stay on Daniela's side of the room and away from her older sister's side. It was a small room though, and we were children, so we didn't listen. Somewhere in the middle of being all over the place, we knock down the Tinkerbell doll and it completely shatters. Immediately, we all freak out because we were told by our aunt to stay away from that side of the room and we completely disobeyed her. Not to mention, my aunt was terrifying, so we knew we were in for a beating. We tried to think of ways to fix it, but there was no way. It was completely shattered. So, realizing we're screwed, we start crying. We go downstairs, and in tears, we apologize to our aunt for disobeying her and breaking the doll. 
She starts yelling at us and then decides to go upstairs and clean up our mess. Well, here's where things get weird. Once she gets upstairs, she starts screaming at us again, but this time she's calling us liars. We run upstairs and come to find out that the doll isn't shattered. It's completely intact and back to where it was before. We immediately look at each other with our jaws dropped. It was then that my cousin Daniela went from being scared with us to almost being relieved and starts saying, I told you guys I wasn't crazy. The doll's possessed. I told you, I told you. The rest of us ran out of that room and called for our parents to come and get us. After that day, we refused to go back in that house. A few years ago, I was part of a local paranormal investigation team. On one investigation, the client had several dolls among her possessions, many of which were in a display case in the living room. Upon arrival, we were doing a walkthrough to determine the hot spots for us to check out, decide camera placement, and to get some basic background information. While in the living room, the client invited us to check out a few specific dolls from the case that held particular interest to her. Three dolls were taken out of the case and looked at by a few of our team members. The one that caught my attention the most was wearing a dress and cape, had beautiful curly hair, and was about six inches tall. When I was done checking the doll out, I handed it back to the client to be returned to the case. After the normal settling that takes place after the doll is back in its spot and the case was closed, I started to turn away from the case. Two other team members and the client witnessed the next thing that happened. The doll reached out toward me as though it wanted me to pick it back up. I almost ran out of the house, but I reminded myself that I was there to help determine what was going on there. Some things were debunked as normal and other things were determined to be paranormal or unexplained, but that doll freaked me out. 